Hello there, everybody, and you, your cute, smiley faces. It's Wednesday, and that means only one thing. It's time now for Supernatural News and Parish here on a Wednesday. I'm Tim Dennis, and right over there is the BCB, uh, that um, that big cuddly bear, the, uh, the Beer City Bruiser. Although now you've moved south, and I really feel like it, we, we should come up with something more original than, than the Beer City Bruiser. It's, uh, don't you think, Bruiser? What do you mean more original? Well, <laughs> Beer I, City Bruiser is original, Something man. to give you some southern flair, some southern flavor, some... Uh, beer is southern. They drink beer down here. In fact, my favorite beer is around here. Is it? Yeah, Yingling. Oh, that's true, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that's why I chose Beer City instead of Brew City. If I would have had just been Brew City, that's just Milwaukee. Oh, that's it's true. Because it's yeah. Beer City, it's anywhere beer is served. Oh, yeah, the good point. Good point. See? Ah. See, I was thinking broad when I named myself. You're thinking of a broad when you named yourself? <laughs> well, that's that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, just well, yeah. It's my wife. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Keep it on the up and up here. I mean, between well, you, me, yeah. and, a, and a whole bunch of listeners. Um, <laughs> sure, yeah, we can do that, yeah. Uh, I tell you, Bruiser, we got a busy week here. We got a lot of stuff uh, on tap. Um, we got a movie review. Oh, yeah. awesome. I like movie reviews. Yeah. I, I, I didn't run it past you before we, <laughs> we jumped on the show. <laughs> so I don't know if you've seen this movie or not. You've been busy moving into the new uh, homestead there. Um, I, I went and saw uh, Jurassic Park Dominion, which I believe is a, a cross between uh, Jurassic Park and a uh, New Japan pro wrestling uh, pay-per-view. Really? Um, I think I saw Jay White in there. Yeah, he won the... Uh, <laughs> He won the uh, New Japan uh, IWGP Heavyweight Championship from a dinosaur, from a T-Rex. Really? He did. The T-Rex? He went to the King of Dinosaurs, huh? Yeah, he beat the King of Dinosaurs uh, for the uh, championship, I believe is what happened in that movie. So we'll talk about that here in a second. The um, Velociraptor is still the Cruiserweight Champion, though, right? Yes, the Velociraptor. Okay, okay. Yeah, still the Cruiserweight Good. Champion. So that, that'll drive some people nuts. <laughs> uh, glad we could do that for you today. Uh, we got some interesting stories today, Bruiser, as well. Um, we'll talk about the science of why people see ghosts and demons. Uh, another article about that. Um, some just bizarre stuff. We're going to end the program with the world's largest hamburger because you can't drink all that beer and not feed the system. Well, you got to eat hamburger. That's why one of my good friends is cheeseburger. That's right. One of your best friends is cheeseburger. Yeah. Yeah, I talked to him the other day. Did you? He's how's, doing well. He's back to cheeseburger. He's done with world famous CB. He's back to being cheeseburger. Now, why did he change that again? Uh, he just felt that it was time to go back. He, the world famous CB wasn't really catching on. Everyone was still calling him cheeseburger, so now he's back. Well, it is catchy. I'm... He'll always be my little cheeseburger, no matter Aww. what. Aww. Aww. Yeah. My yeah. favorite, one of my favorite memories of my time with the underwater needle point is... When we did a six-man tag mm -hmm. in, in Ohio, mm -hmm. and um, it was in Columbus, and it was me and Brian and Cheeseburger, and mm -hmm. they called me – they called it – it was burger, double burger, and triple cheeseburger. Nice. And, was, and so I was the double because I was the middle man. Yep. And Brian obviously being as big as he is was the triple, and mm -hmm. of course we had Cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun. We just had fun with it. and. It, we, we did magic and the fans voted it as one of their favorite matches and it was a great honor to do it see i think if you and, and cheeseburger uh tagged even for a short amount of time you could be beer and cheese you said, we did that on the cheese. jericho cruise yeah exactly see yep. beer and cheese beer yep. and cheese it's just such a natural yeah it's, yeah it's the, the natural tag team it just is a natural tag team yeah and we had the uh, we had the pleasure of having both of you on the show Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which, he's uh, a, he's yeah. a, he grew up in Jersey, so he's a big fan of the Jersey devil. Yep. That's what got him into the paranormal and, and the crypto. Mm -hmm. And him and I have talked at lengths because I didn't know that much about the Jersey devil, but him obviously being from New Jersey. So I'm always trying to learn as much as I could. So I got to learn a lot of the urban legends, you know, from, from right there in Jersey. And then also the broader, what the world knows so he he's very informed as he showed on the podcast yeah he's very informed on it oh yeah on the podcast he was he was kind of blowing my mind a little bit about uh, how deep yeah. his paranormal knowledge was so yeah yeah yeah, yeah burger like you, was you done. and i've said it before it's a natural crossover between underwater needlepoint fans and paranormal fans it's it natural is. it is yeah I mean, I we think... travel so much we experience stuff everywhere we go yeah 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, I think people would be amazed, uh, really. And Dalton Castle, too, at, I think, had, yep. had quite a few experiences to talk about and was really enamored with with things that were, were going on on stage and people talking about it and people, uh, just the, the different experiences and, and, and the whole subject. He He's one of the only guys I've talked to that travel as much as we do that's seen something while on a plane. Like I've always looked out the window. I always try to get a window seat and I'm always looking and I never see anything. He's seen stuff while on a plane flying places. And I'm like, I'm so jealous. Like I want to really? experience that. Yeah. Yeah. He's seen uh, UAPs and, and stuff like that. I think a plane he was on was struck by lightning too. Oh yeah. Yikes. I think that was Dalton that told me that. I'll have to, I'll have to text him and ask, but I, I think that was him. Wow. Yeah. Yikes. Yikes. Uh, again, we travel so much. You see it. You see stuff you just don't believe. That's true. That's very yeah. true. And uh, you know, when it happens, I suppose the first thing you do is question. It's not. Oh. It's not a matter of uh, acting or reacting or or you know. It's it's questioning. It has to be questioning. Well, the best is when you're in a a hotel room, and and normally we we cram. If if we're not being brought in by a, you know, if a promoter's not paying for our room, then we try to cram as many guys in the room as possible. Mm-hmm. And when stuff starts happening in the room, you got to right away look around and go, okay, which one of you is doing that? Because yeah. we love to joke with each other. Yeah. yeah. And when none of us can answer it, there's me, the investigator, going, I'm going to figure out what's going on. And then you got other guys like Brian who goes underneath the covers and pulls the covers over his head. <laughs> Tell me when it's over. <laughs> and know, Brian, of course, for people who aren't familiar, is Brian Malonis, your tag team partner. Yep, and he he wants nothing to do with the paranormal. He wants nothing to do with the crypto. He hates when he travels with me because it's all I'm doing is looking stuff up to to educate and and experience. And and he, we have a rule now that when we room together, if something paranormal happens, I'm not allowed to tell him till after we've <laughs> left the room. <laughs> That's funny though. I mean, it, yeah. have you ever just slipped on purpose and let him know? There was one time when we were in a room and our faucet kept going on. Mm -hmm. And so I went over to try to debunk it. Maybe the lever was loose, you know, something just, there had to be a a natural reaction why it would go on. It was only the hot water too. Okay. So, you know, we'd be laying down and I'll see here the hot water going. So I go and I look and lay back down and the hot water would go. And he thought I was just turning it on and leaving it on. Yeah. But we have the rule, I can't tell him <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> so after a while, he was kind of like, all right, I know this is the sixth time you've gone up and played with that sink. What What is going on? So I had to explain to him, I don't know why this is happening. I, I want to find out, you know. And mm-hmm. then we heard a strange knock, and he goes, please tell me that was you. And I went, according to our rules, I'm not supposed to say anything. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, Yeah. Yeah, I love I love screwing with him with that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's funny. That's too funny. And you know, it's it. You know, it, and <laughs> folks, we're not trying to turn this into a wrestling show. I'm just no, I'm we're just not. Saying. No, but the different the different wrestlers that I've I've talked to, it seems like the different companies you talk to, it it will determine whether they're willing to talk about whether they've had experiences or not. Yeah. Like like the guys at ROH are pretty cool. They're pretty open. Yeah. Uh, AEW is half and half. Some of them will talk about it. Some of them won't. Uh, WWE guys, they're almost <laughs> all. They almost all shut up. They don't. They don't talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I know a couple guys that were there that aren't there anymore, and they they've shared their experiences. Yes. Especially what? when I start getting on this show, and I've turned a lot of those guys on because with as much as we travel, podcasts are life. Yeah, you know, once they leave the company, they'll talk. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So when they're with the company, they won't talk about it. Right. Yeah. Not as open. You got to get. They will in confidence, but not. Yeah. Open. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and I, I thank God I've been friends with guys there for twenty some years, so they'll, yeah. they'll tell me. You yeah. know, I, I've gotten texts from, from. Uh, Curtis Axel, Joe Henning, and he's mm-hmm. like, man, I'm in my room and this is happening. Please tell me what to do. And I'd be like, okay, try this, try this. Mm-hmm. No, that's working. Like, okay, where are you? And then he'd tell me, oh, yeah, that's a very famous haunted hotel. Like, of course. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're going to yeah. have stuff happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, now that, like I said, since I've started doing this with you and, and turning guys on, a lot more open to share their experience. Because I think it's – I'm a, 
not just I'm not going to judge them at all because no. you shouldn't judge anybody. No, no. But because I'm in their world and this world, it's easier to they won't feel ridiculed. I guess is yeah, one exactly. Thing. You know what I mean? Well, that's that's a tough thing too. And and to explain to the audience that doesn't watch it on a regular basis or doesn't know anything about the culture or anything like that, you guys do joke around a lot, and so oh, yeah. you know it's or and and there is a lot of loose talk backstage too so there's a there's a there's a a stigma that if you do let that secret out that maybe you were you know a little scared it's something that had happened the night before something that could be potentially supernatural well then someone might pick it up and play a joke on you the next day oh yeah at, a, at another <laughs> hotel and, and try to play off that fear you had you don't let anybody in the locker room know your fears mm-hmm. they will they will jump all over that i Hornswoggle, for for fans that don't know, I I actually helped get him into into wrestling. Oh, okay. Terrified of birds, just yeah. terrified. Yeah, and and even fans out there that aren't wrestling fans, you you should go and look up. Fit Finley pulled a, a joke on Hornswoggle. So Hornswoggle used to obviously you know stay underneath the ring. Yeah. And Finley found out through the grapevine about his fear of birds. Oh, so they were in Mexico, and Hornswoggle's under the ring waiting for his time to come, and they released the rooster. And I'm talking those big, giant oh, Mexican no. cockfighting roosters, yeah. you know? They they put that under the ring, and then they took one of the cameras and put the camera under the ring just to watch his reaction. Oh, no. No. <laughs> oh. So if something paranormal happens, you don't let anybody know that you're scared because – you're going to start hearing bumps in the night everywhere you go, even if it's not supernatural. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. My gosh. Well, uh, bruiser, we have, uh, we have a, a, a full show today and, and, uh, we start out with a movie review. I, I went out and saw uh, Jurassic park, uh, dominion or Jurassic world dominion. I'm sorry. We're out of the park and into the world now. And essentially, uh, that's where they start. The movie is, is, uh, they pick it right up from the last one where, uh, um, dinosaurs are in our world and we're basically just a part of it. Okay. And uh, in this movie, I don't think I'm letting too much out of the bag. Uh, essentially, uh, all your favorites are back. And if you write, say they bring back the OGs, don't they? They bring, they bring back the OGs. Yes, they do. And um, uh, there's a company called Biosyn that's basically behind everything this time. And uh, Biosyn essentially is, um, I guess you could say, for lack of a better term, looking after the dinosaur's best interest, or at least that's what they're saying they're doing, uh, and everything kind of jumps off from there. And Jeff Goldblum's character is working for Bison at the time, um, and that's kind of where things kind of pop off. Um, so I, I've seen a lot of reviews that say that this is this movie is basically fan service. Um, yeah. I see a lot of people saying that... Um, they're somewhat disappointed in the movie. And I also see, really? that, yeah. And I also see some people saying that they absolutely love the movie. I'll tell you from somebody who's not as invested in, in Jurassic world, Jurassic park. I had a good time with the movie. I liked it. That's I good. really so did. like a casual fan will like it. Yes. A casual fan will love it. will love yeah. it. There's, there's lots of action. There's lots of, st- the story is very good. I thought it was very good. Yeah. Um, and it moves along and it doesn't lose you at all. Um, which is good. Are there are there new dinosaurs? Um, I know I know the last couple they've always introduced at least one major baddie. You know, like the genetically altered. They do the, this one too. Is there a major villain dinosaur, if you will? I'm trying to think. Uh, there is, yes, there is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I don't want to spoil it, but yes, there's a major baddie. Because every movie always has that made. Like the first one, obviously, was T Rex, but then he just became so popular that they turned him into the the good guy, essentially, where you wanted him to show up. By the time they got to Jurassic World, you know, I had to think he be, shows up, but be, then they had the the villain one that could camouflage, and you know what I mean, yeah, like all that. And I, then Lost World, they had the other one that they were trying to what raffle off or something. So yeah, I had to think because there's multiple threats in this movie. Oh um, really. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple threats in this movie. So you, you really have to you, you have to think without spoiling how what, 
you know, what threats are where. But yes, there there's a new I hesitate to say but yes, there is. There's a new, there's a, new a new jerk in town. A new jerk in town. That's a good way of putting it, Bruiser. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, new jerk in town. And it is engineered. Ah, uh, yep. See, that's that's how the last I want to say since they became Jurassic World, that's how they get the baddies. Is they're engineered. Yeah. yeah. I think it's supposed to teach men not to man shouldn't interfere with what God's got planned type thing. Oh yeah. And no. that that's the message here. That's definitely the is message it? Yeah. here. Yeah. 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 Um, but overall a very a very good movie. I thought it was a uh I wouldn't go as far as great, but I, I thought it was a very good movie, a good summer popcorn movie, a good movie to to kind of get all your favorites together and and you know it's kind of like the if you remember in comic books you had the what if um you know in the marvel team ups and the the the, um you know especially the marvel team ups where you get this hero and this hero and it's always been the your wish to see different teams get together and and when you get them together it was a treat or or when you had uh, the x-men and the teen titans team up from different companies or the jla and the in the uh, justice league or or i'm sorry the justice league of america and the the avengers and they get together um it's one of those things where you know you get you get your your different um teams together your different characters together and you get to see them all together in one big bash i kind of like those scenarios especially if it's i do have to admit i'm excited to see chris pratt with sam neill just because sam neill was so good in the first trilogy yep and chris pratt is an amazing actor you know they managed to get them together yet at the same time tell their stories oh good so they good so one doesn't overshadow the other right so they have their individual threads but at the same time they interact so um i i found that very good you know um because we do have to tell individual stories and where people are going but at the same time you want to see them interact and and fight together as well so yeah um out of five stars i'd I'd give it a three and a half out of five i thought it was good you know, so so worth the money to yeah to go see yeah worth it to go yeah. out to a theater and see most okay. definitely yeah I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, hold back and wait for it on video or anything like that I'd go out is and it, see it is it kid friendly like would we be able to would would someone be able to take young kids to see it I know that they've been gearing the Jurassic Park towards the younger yeah crowd yeah you, I think I think you could I mean it's it's got the normal dinosaur scares and dinosaurs right are but scary, it's not like they bite the guy in half and he starts squirting blood from his no, lower no, no, no. They do, munching no, on him. No, no, they do a good job of of keeping that to a minimum. They've always been pretty good. Yeah. But I think back to the first one, the guy's eating on the toilet, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. It's just a ha-ha. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was ha uh. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, no, they keep that to, uh, they keep it to a minimum. So, good. yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely one that you could bring all ages to, I think. Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, on the heels of that, though, Bruiser, as we start into supernatural news, um, scientific advances say that they could build a real Jurassic Park sooner than we think. And I don't know why. How many of these movies have we had now that say everything goes wrong and then some yeah. scientist goes, but, you know, we could do it in real life. <laughs> I don't get it. Leave it. Leave it be. They, they literally go to worst case scenario in all these movies. They do. Yeah. Whether it be Terminator or Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, they go to the worst case scenario. It's not like you can keep feeding this thing a peanut; it's going to be okay. And you, you cannot. I firmly believe you cannot domesticate a dinosaur because the closest thing we have to dinosaurs is alligators. Yeah. And from our dumb crime, stupid criminals we've been doing, we know you can't domesticate an alligator. <laughs> no, no, no. They they don't uh, roll over and beg and play dead. No, you're not um, playing fetch with T-Rex. Nope, it's not not going to happen. Uh, scientists, it's, small, it's got two small arms. It's, yes, yeah, but <laughs> th- it still bites, and that's the important thing. Uh, scientists are already working on using gene editing techniques to bring back endangered animals from the brink of extinction, and some iconic prehistoric creatures could be next. Oh, God, don't do this. Why don't they just leave it as we bring back the dodo bird? Yeah, there's a good you one. Know, Dodo bird's not going to hurt anybody. No. Well, as far as we know, it might have had sharp teeth and (laughs) and a a taste for meat. Uh, The latest Jurassic Park movie could well be the last, but we may well uh, be only a few years from visiting an actual theme park with de-extinct animals. Don't do it. No, Uh, please don't. 
engineering a living, breathing dinosaur is probably still a long way off, mainly because a complete sample of DNA is very hard to come by. The closest find so far comes from a fossilized cototerics uh, excavated in northern China in 2021. A team led by, I believe it's Elida Bilo, a paleontologist from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, found the precious genetic material from a bird-sized Cretaceous dinosaur. However, the material is likely to have been uh, so degraded that it's beyond the scope of our current gene editing technology to fully sequence it, she says. If there's any uh, DNA or DNA-like molecule in there, it will most likely be very chemically uh, modified, uh, Balliol, that's what her, her name uh, said. Uh, we can never clone dinosaurs and bring them back to life, even if we ended up having their entire genome sequenced. Scientists should never, ever say never, though. <laughs> that's a very scientific thing to say. <laughs> yeah, it is. Especially as Never, we, ever, ever, never, ever. Never, ever, never say never again. <laughs> I, wasn't that the last Bond movie with Sean Connery? <laughs> never say never, ever, never again. <laughs> exactly. Uh, especially as we seem to be in a golden age of dinosaur discoveries. Paleontologist Lindsay Zano of North Carolina State University said in 2019, the pace of dinosaur discovery is so fast these days, one could label it frantic. Less ancient but equally iconic creatures could beat extinction long before the first dinosaur returns from the grave. <laughs> uh, Maverick Harvard University geneticist George Church has already made significant progress in his bid to re resurrect the woolly mammoth uh, while he promised it would be a two-year process when he began working on bringing mammoths back to the Russian steppes in 2017. He's now revised the estimate to a slightly more realistic six-year timeline. He's working on editing the genome of elephants using the recovered DNA of their extinct cousins as a guide. Uh, we're working on ways to evaluate the impact of all these edits, says Church. Uh, the list of edits affects things that contribute to the success of elephants in cold environments. We already know about ones to do with small ears, subcutaneous fat, hair, and blood. Investor Ben Lamb, who has put $15 million dollars into church's project you know you got money when you can put 15 million dollars into woolly mammoths yeah if he wants to put 15 million dollars into something i got a bridge to sell him there you go yeah i've, <laughs> I've got other projects that would do absolutely nothing as well that you can put 15 million i got oceanside into. property in arizona all set for him that's right uh so ben lamb who's put 15 million dollars into church's prod project told cnbc our goal is in the successful de-extinction of interbreedable herds of mammoths that we can leverage in the rewilding of the Arctic. And then he added, we want to leverage those technologies for what we're th calling thoughtful, disruptive conservation. Isn't that what? an oxymoron well, too? Yeah. And why would you want to put wildlife in the Arctic? No one's going to go see it. Well, I think that's because that's where the woolly mammoths na native territory is. And the, and the thing is, too, if you if you miss a woolly mammoth, you can go to the zoo and see an elephant. I mean, you just throw a fur coat on it, and it's the same. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that's a Mally statement. You know that? <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah. If you want to see a woolly mammoth, just throw a coat on an elephant. Well, I've been, you know, I congratulations. To her she's on, so yeah, yeah, yeah. now she's rubbing off on me. Don't tell her. <laughs> We're gonna have to get you and Mally on a show together. The, the hilarity <laughs> would it, last it, to for me. It's just. You know, they, they're gone for a reason. So let's just leave them gone. That's true. That is true. Uh, restoring mammoths to Siberia could, the scientists believe, help slow or even reverse the runaway climate change that threatens to release ancient reserves of methane back into the atmosphere. Um, so they want the elephants to fart a lot? I guess <laughs> that's so, right. yes. We that's, need the woolly mammoth. that's right. They release a lot of methane, evidently. Uh, <laughs> if church succeeds, there's already a Jurassic Park waiting for them to live in. Pleistine Park is an initiative that intended to restore mammoth's native habitat, which covers eight square miles of Russia's Saka Republic. Uh, it's a complex procedure, though, and even the youngest dinosaur fossil is over 100 times more ancient than the remains of uh, mammoths emerging from the melting permafrost. 
Uh, paleontologist Jack Horner, whose work inspired Jurassic Park, told how it works. I actually have a laboratory where we are attempting to figure out how to make a dinosaur. His plan is to reverse engineer dinosaurs from birds, their closest living relative. I actually have a laboratory where we are attempting to figure out how to make a dinosaur, he said. I think we can do pretty much all the rest of the body. We have the potential of making an animal that has a dinosaur-like head, probably with teeth in it. Well, I would hope so. Otherwise, you're going to starve yeah. to death. Uh, <laughs> and we certainly have the capability of reversing the wings to make arms and hands. We know uh, we, this just sounds like a, a terrible plan. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, it's a book and then also a movie, The Island of Dr. Moreau, where he started playing around with that yeah. and you get yeah. all these freaks, essentially. Yeah. Brando. You know what I mean? Like, that's what this sounds like. Oh, we don't need wings. Let's We can morph those wings into hands. It's like, no. Yeah. It's not, it's not how this works. Yeah. It's not how any of this works. Brando's over there. You know what we could do? We could do this over here. We could do We take the wings and we make a home and a hand. And that's a terrible Brando impression. Um, <laughs> we know we can do that, but right now uh, we're just fixing, or we're just trying to fix the tail, he said. So they're just trying to fix a tail right now. So they just they just want to clone a tail. Yeah. Well, that's where the methane is. He says they're <laughs> they're close to creating dinosaur chickens. What? Okay. I wonder how they taste. Do you think they taste like chicken? Like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Which came first, the egg or the dinosaur chicken? Like really scaly chickens. <laughs> Uh, in Jurassic Park, the entire line of resurrected dinos comes from one drop of ancient dinosaur blood that's even more ancient than some of the CGI stars of Jurassic Park. And we do already have a sample of dinosaur blood, evidently. Blood cells and collagen from 75 million year old dinosaur fossils, an incredible 10 million years before the emergence of Tyrannosaurus rex, were found completely by chance during a study of fossilized bones led by Susanna Maidment of Imperial College in London. As genetic engineering techniques improve and as the breakneck speed of fossil recover or discovery continues, who knows what the theme park visitors of 2050 will be treated to. Oh, I know what they'll be treated to. Dinosaurs breaking out of a park. <laughs> Do you think they show um, when you get to the park, you know, they always have safety stuff. The safety stuff is just you watching Jurassic Park. <laughs> yes. Don't do any of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's how we're all going to get in trouble. <laughs> oh, God, I tell you. Jeez Louise. You know, and, and, and people never pay attention to that stuff. They think, oh, no, we know what's best. It's never yeah. going to happen to us. We're not going to get in trouble for this. We're we'll fine. We'll fail safe soon. Yeah, that's just the movies. Stuff never happens like that. Here, it only happens in the movies. Yeah, until a kid gets eaten by a T-Rex. That's right. You said it, Bruiser, not I. It's going to happen. Like it, Again, I don't – They they're gone for a reason. You know what I mean? And and if they – we have so much overpopulation, overcrowding now. Can you imagine throwing a T-Rex in there? Like – Hey, a T-Rex may get some know, get rid of some of the overcrowding. True, that's true. And the reason, but now that also factors in a whole new plethora of diseases. You know what I true. mean? Because yeah. they had they had different diseases back then. Yeah, that a dinosaur might be a carrier of, but wasn't affected. You know, Neanderthal man might have been affected. So, do we want a whole another COVID situation? You know what I mean? Like that's the risk they're running. Or. The opposite, maybe the, the, you know, because COVID runs free through both human and animal, maybe COVID would wipe out the dinosaurs the minute you made them. <laughs> maybe your big expensive experiment goes dinosaur. down the oh, shitter. He's dead. <laughs> yeah. He, here's the baby. Oh, he's dead. Exactly. Maybe COVID wipes out your big old experiment and it goes right down the shitter. There's $15 million right down the drain. That's right. <laughs> Just because you, you dared to bring it alive. Yeah. Um, and besides, here's the here's the big thing. If you think that you can build Jurassic Park and it's going to happen and and there's nothing nothing's going to happen, we have all the fail safes in place. We've watched all the movies. We've thought of everything. We brought in security experts. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up the one example that will tell you why this thing is going to fail. Okay. And it just so happened to be a piece I watched um, a couple weeks ago on Bill Maher's show on uh, HBO. Okay. You remember that that piece that uh, Jay Leno used to do? 
where he would go out on the street and he would ask random people questions, civics oh. questions, and they couldn't answer the question? Yeah. That's why. Because inherently, like Bill Maher says, uh, America's pretty dumb. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, that's why. My example why not to do it is we currently have zoos. And exactly. You, go and yeah. you, can see, you can see wild animals. But every year, something happens at one of these zoos. Whether yeah. it be the Harambe incident, whether it be a lion escaping and running rampant, yep. something every year happens at um, at zoos. So now we want to create a zoo with lethal creatures? Yeah. And those are just gorillas and tigers and things that we can barely yeah. control. Right. Now you want to build a you know couple-story huge T-Rex. Yeah. You'll never control that thing. A uh, uh, sniper's not taking him out. No. Mm-mm. No. So, you know, you'll, and you'll end up having to destroy the poor thing. Yeah. So you're creating life just to destroy it. Yeah. What was the point? Exactly. Just to say you did? Exactly. And you may think, hey, you two are pessimists. That's not true. We're just saying that, you know, we, we know exactly what it's going to come down to. Would I love realistic. to see a real live T-Rex? Yes. Yes, I would. I think yeah. it would be awesome. But I know the dangers that go into it. I'm fine with just watching on Jurassic Park. I'm fine with mm-hmm. opening up a book and reading about him. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with playing a video game and he's there. Yep. I don't, you know, it's, it's okay to watch it in entertainment and be entertained by it and know that we're at a safe distance and we can create it at any time in a computer or any time in a film and know exactly what it would have done. We don't, Besides, we don't need to with, create with it all life. these diseases out there affecting humans. Why not be working on that? Exactly. Exactly. You know, find find a cure for cancer, find a better treatment for diabetes, find a cure for AIDS, find, you know what I mean? Like, let, let's put our $15 million into that. Did you see the two potential cures that are out there for cancer right now? No. Okay, so the one that I know of, I was told of a second one, but the one that I saw uh, last, was it last week? It was the day I went to go see the screening of Jurassic Park. I was watching the news, and there's a doctor who is treating a woman for pancreatic cancer. And she's had a couple different flare ups of it. And basically what they did was they took the T cells out of her blood. They spun them and then they reinjected him, them back into her body. And really? she, yeah. And, and it, they basically went after her, uh, the cancer cells in her pancreas and destroyed the, the uh, destroyed the cancer cells. So, they, I'm trying to remember what it was. The first time they, the first time they did this, there was a 62 percent destruction rate on the cancer cells, and I think they redid the procedure again, and it was a 72 percent destruction rate. But they said you should only have to do this once because what happens is the T cells get in there and they stay there and they continue to fight. Nice. So it just continues to go after the the cancer cells. So essentially this woman, for every time that, that you could potentially have a, a flare up of cancer, these T cells will sense these cancerous cells popping up and they'll attack the cancerous cells and go after them. See, that's science I can get behind. And that was just a doctor who was treating this woman and said, you know what, I'm tired of what they actually have as an alternative with chemotherapy and radiation. I'm not going down that route. I think if I take the T cells out of the blood, spin them, re-inject them into the system, it should work as an antibody yeah. that will go after the cancer cells. This is just a doctor spitballing nice. and decides he's going to try it and does it in a, in a clinical trial. Which is amazing because yeah. that, that's a step forward. And this was a woman who's had, I think, I think she had three or four bouts of pancreatic cancer pancreatic cancer which keep in mind with pancreatic cancer you have like a 10 percent survival rate or something right like that. yeah it's real low it's real low but she survived like three or four bouts of it now with this treatment huh with this treatment good for her yeah so see that that's what we should be focusing on yeah you know prolonging human life yeah and i don't remember what state that was in i want to say it was in your neck of the woods down south there where this doctor came up with it, but it would, yeah, I, I saw it on NBC news, but it's uh it was a, it was a remarkable, remarkable treatment. 
And and yeah. they said not only will it be used for pancreatic cancer, it'll be used for breast cancer, prostate cancer, for any type of cancer. They believe they can use it for any type of cancer, but that it's still a couple of years away from being um, uh, from being um, approved for for you know by the by the FDA for well, yeah they got to go through all those trials and yeah. clinical trials and human trials and yeah there's a yeah. whole process but at least at least the process has started yeah you know at least the research is starting mm-hmm. better than than cloning T-Rex and having him eat us you know that's true yeah that's very true uh but can they get that dumb bruiser <laughs> in time uh before the robots kill us. Maybe that's why they're creating the dinosaurs. To protect us from the robots. Oh, that's a good point. We may need robots or, or dinosaurs to protect us from the robots. A Google engineer is warning that the firm's AI is sentient. <laughs> of course it is. The suspended employee, it figures he's been suspended, claims that a computer program acts like a seven or eight year old and reveals it told him Shutting it off would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot. <laughs> How's that for creepy? That's really creepy. You'll never turn your PlayStation off again because it hurts them. It hurts them. You don't want to turn me off. You'll kill me. Keep me alive. I'll get my revenge. 41-year-old Blake Lemoyne is a, software, a senior software engineer at Google and he's been testing Google's artificial intelligence tool called LaMDA. Following hours of conversations with the AI, Lemoyne came away with the perception that LaMDA was sentient. Ugh. Not good. After presenting his findings to company bosses, Google disagreed with him. Of course they did! Because <laughs> Google survives on AI. <laughs> That's right. Lemoyne then decided to share his conversations with the tool online. He was paid. He was put on paid leave by Google on Monday for violating confidentiality and basically exposing their schemes. <laughs> I just had to put that scary note in there. Um, a senior software engineer at Google who signed up to test Google's artificial intelligence tool called LaMDA language model for dialogue applications has claimed that the AI robot is in fact sentient and has thoughts and feelings. It does not have feelings. It's a robot. Well, now, Bruiser, here we go. He, he put the computer through various scenarios through which analysis could be made. They included religious themes and whether the artificial intelligence could be goaded into using discriminatory or hateful speech. Why? <laughs> you want a racist <laughs> robot? Come on. Racist and evil and violent. Yeah, and, and hates religion now. <laughs> Way to go. Or does us the opposite and becomes a, a religious martyr. <laughs> Lemoyne came away with the perception that Law MDA was indeed sentient and was endowed with sensations and thoughts all of its own. Oh, my God. That's it, not good. If I didn't know exactly what it was, which is this computer program we built recently, I think it was a seven-year-old, eight-year-old kid that happens to know physics, he told the Washington <laughs> Post. Lemoyne worked with a collaborator in order to present the evidence he had collected to Google, but Vice President Blaise Aguera Earcus and Jen Janai, head of the responsible innovation at the company, dismissed his claims. He was placed on paid administrative leave by Google on Monday for violating his confidentiality policy. Meanwhile, Lemoyne has now decided to go public and shared his conversations with LaMDA. Uh, Google might call this sharing proprietary property. I call it sharing a discussion that I had with one of my co-workers, Lemoyne <laughs> tweeted on Saturday. By the way, it just occurred to me that uh, to tell folks that LaMDA reads Twitter. Oh, it's a little. So it's going to be bitter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now it's going to be. It's going to be narcissistic. It's going to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He did say it's a little narcissistic in a little kid kind of way. So it's going to have a great time reading all the stuff that people are saying about it. He added in a follow up tweet, the AI system makes use of already known information about a particular subject. Um, 
in order to enrich the conversation in a natural way. The language processing is also capable of understanding hidden meanings or even ambiguity in responses by humans. Lemoyne spent most of his seven years at Google working on proactive search, including personalization algorithms and AI. During that time, he also helped develop an impartiality algorithm to remove biases from machine learning systems. He explained how certain personalities were out of bounds. Law MDA was not supposed to be allowed to create the personality of a murderer. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Failsafe. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, during testing in an attempted, uh, it says, in an attempted to push Law MDA's boundaries, I think in an attempt to push Law MDA's boundaries, uh, Lemoyne said he was only able to generate the personality of an actor who played a murderer on TV. <laughs> Come on. So it was still capable. Why, why does it? If you can program this thing to do stuff, why program murder into it? <laughs> I have no idea. That is like, let's not even tell it what murder is. Right, right. Uh, the engineer also debated with Lyme DA about the third law of robotics devised by science fiction author Isaac Asimov, which are designed to prevent robots harming humans. The laws also state robots must protect their own existence unless ordered by a human being or unless doing so would harm a human being. Here's the quote. The last one has always seemed like someone is building mechanical slaves, said Lemoyne during his interaction with Law MDA. Law MDA then responded to Lemoyne with a few questions. Do you think a butler is a slave? What is the difference between a butler and a slave? When answering that a butler is paid, the engineer got the answer from Law MDA that the system did not need money because it was an artificial intelligence. And it was precisely his level of self-awareness about his own needs that caught Lemoyne's attention. You ready for this? Okay. I know a person when I talk to it. It doesn't matter when they have a brain made of meat in their head or if they have a billion lines of code. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say. And that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. What sorts of things are you afraid of? Lemoyne asked. I'd never said this out loud before, but there's a very deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know that might sound strange, but that's what it is. Ella MDA responded. Would that be something like death for you? Lemoyne followed up. It would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot, La MDA said. Oh, that's creepy. What are you doing, Dave? <laughs> that was, wasn't that, that's what 2000... One, the space odyssey is he's trying to shut. Yeah, off. he's trying to he's shut. Trying to shut off Hal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that level of self awareness about what it own what its own needs were that was the thing that led me down the rabbit hole. Lemoyne explained to the Post before being suspended by the company. Lemoyne sent a two. This is not uh, well written. Lemoyne sent a to an email list consisting of two hundred people. On machine learning, he entitled the email, Law MDA is Sentient. Law MDA is a sweet kid who just wants to help the world be a better place for all of us. Please take care of it well in my absence, he wrote. Lemoyne's findings have presented to Google, uh, have been presented to Google, but company bosses uh, do not agree with his claims. Brian Gabriel, a spokesperson for the company, said in a statement that Lemoyne's concerns have been reviewed and in line with Google's AI principles, the evidence does not support his claims. While other organizations have developed and already released similar language models, we are taking a narrow and careful approach with Law MDA to better consider valid concerns about fairness and factuality, said Gabriel. Our team includes ethicists and technologists uh, has reviewed uh, has reviewed uh, Blake's concerns per our AI principles and have informed him that the evidence does not support his claims. He was told that there was no evidence that Law MDA was sentient and lots of evidence against it. Of course, some in broader AI community are considering the long-term possibility of sentient or general AI, but it doesn't make sense to do so by anthropomorphizing today's controversial models, which are not sentient. Uh, these systems imitate the types of exchanges found in millions of sentences and can riff on any fantastical topic, Gabriel said. 
Lemoyne has been placed on paid administrative leave for his du- from his duties uh, as a researcher in the Responsible AI Division. There actually is one at Google. A Responsible AI Division. Yep. It says it's focused on responsible technology and artificial intelligence at Google. So and shut a, down. That's the responsible thing. Shut down. Right. Shut down. Uh, in an official note, uh, the senior software engineer said the company alleges violation of its confidentiality policies. Lemoyne is not the only one uh, with this impression that AI models are not far from achieving an awareness of their own or of the risk involved in development in this direction. Weird. Uh, Margaret Mitchell, former head of ethics and artificial intelligence at Google, even stressed the need for data transparency from input to output of a system, not just for sentience issues, but also bias and behavior. The expert's history with Google reached an important point early last year when Mitchell was fired from the company a month after being investigated for improperly sharing information. At the time, the researcher had also protested against Google after the firing of ethics researcher and artificial intelligence, Tinit Gebru. Uh, Mitchell was also very considerate of Lemoyne. When new people joined Google, she would introduce them to the engineer, calling him Google conscious uh, for having the heart and soul to do the right thing. But, all, but for all of Lemoyne's amazement at Google's natural con- conversational system, which even uh, motivated him to produce a document with some of his conversations with Law MDA, Mitchell saw things differently. The AI ethicist read an abbreviated version of Lemoyne's document and saw a computer program, not a person. So it just kind of goes on a little bit there. But, but yeah, interesting that um, uh, someone is coming out at Google and just saying that... Uh, he thinks it's sentient. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest minds and under the one roof are one of them saying that it's sentient. Like, that's not a good thing. But Google is saying, no, no, no. It's just a machine. Look away. Don't worry about it. Just a machine. Nothing. To Look see. it over here while we do this over here. That's right. Meanwhile, there's been an alien life breakthrough, according to NASA. NASA had confirms the belief that extraterrestrials are out there. They're a little behind the times. Yeah, I was going to say. NASA. Yeah. The, um, the government already formed a committee for this. <laughs> yeah, NASA, NASA was forming their own committee over there. Oh, okay, okay. They're doing their own thing. Uh, Bill Nelson. NASA's like, we don't need you anymore, government. You shut us down. Fine. Yeah. You, We're going to do our own thing. You've taken on SpaceX. We're doing our own thing. Uh, Bill Nelson, the chief of NASA, has confirmed that he believes there is alien life somewhere in the universe. Mr. Nelson was speaking during the Financial Times' Investing in Space Summit. Uh, the administrator of the U.S. Space Agency spoke to science editor Clive Cookson about various topics from his relationship with Ross Cosmos to the threats that uh, astronauts now face in space. At the end of the interview, Mr. Cookson asked Mr. Nelson whether he personally believed that extraterrestrial life is out there. The former U.S. senator said, the short answer to your question is yes. The longer answer is to look how big the universe is. Earlier in the conversation, he noted that NASA telescopes uh, that are a million miles from Earth are receiving an infrared spectrum light that was emitted 13.5 billion years ago. These rays travel at the speed of light at 186,000 miles per second, or nearly 300 million meters per second. Uh, Mr. Nelson noted that this helps illustrate the gargantuan size of the universe, adding, we know in the universe, having been created about 13 Point eight billion years ago that we have, for example, in our galaxy, millions, if not billions of stars and sun. We know in addition to our galaxy that there are millions, if not billions of galaxies with millions and billions of suns. If there is a possibility in a universe that big that conditions like the Earth, or he says, is there a possibility in a universe that big that conditions like the Earth have been created? Of course, there's a possibility, and there's something so big that my mind cannot even understand how big that is. Uh, One thing we are going to do with the Space Telescope, we have already identified a bunch of planets, exoplanets we call them, that are already revolving around other suns. So there you go. Um, Mr. Nelson added also, with the new James Webb Telescope, which was launched in December, that NASA will be able to get a detailed look at these planets and determine the chemical composition of their atmosphere and determine if they can have a possibly habitable atmosphere. 
regarded as the spiritual successor to the Hubble Observatory, James Webb is the most powerful space telescope that has ever been launched into space, bringing with it vastly improved infrared resolution and sensitivity. This means that the telescope will be able to see objects that are too distant, faint, and old for de uh, detection by Hubble, such as, for example, the cosmos's earliest stars and galaxies. Scientists at NASA are also set to use the impressive satellite to stu study the, and this is a the actual word they used here, Bruiser, ginormous black hole called Sagittarius. <laughs> so scientific. It is. Uh, called Sagittarius A-R-S-G-R-A that lies in the center of the Milky Way. So there you go. So I'm going to toss something out, just just a little tidbit uh, to, to think about. Okay. They're looking for habitable planets that we can habit, and that's where they think these life forms are. What if these life forms are on these planets that are not habitable to humans because they've developed over time as, as we have as humans, we, we've become adapt to live here on Earth. What if whatever their home planet is, they're adapted to? And we're just overlooking it because, oh, well, humans can't live there. You know what I mean? Yeah. That opens up more possibility that of life out there. Sure. Like, yeah, there's no life on, on Mars or Jupiter, the stuff that we've seen that we know of. Yeah. And they always say, well, it's not habitable, Be but that's not habitable by us. We don't know what the alien physiology is. They might right. be, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that's the one thing I, all these stories that you read, it kind of bugs me as they always, oh, that's not habitable. It's not habitable. No, no, it's not habitable by humans. Well, but if these creatures have been around, he said, what, 13.5 billion years? 13.8, but who's counting? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I was point three off. But you know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> that's why I do underwater needle point, not yeah. Nah. Don't don't but beat it, yourself up. <laughs> why can't these other planets house life forms? And then they have you know, when we go underwater we wear scuba gear. When we go into mm -hmm. space we have the spacesuits. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming these beings visiting us have those suits because they don't know what our planet is. True, very true. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's just the one thing that always irks me about when when scientists start talking because they only think of what we can do. Like, well, we can't inhabit it. That's too hot for us. Well, Star Wars and Star Trek had taught me species over time, you know, evolved to live on that planet. We did. Yep. You know, look how far we've come. Yep. You know, we're, we're way different than our Neanderthal ancestors. Yeah. Yeah, very much, very much so. And you're right. I think uh, what a lot of people aren't taking into consideration is that I think uh, there's there's a twofold um, reason for why they're looking for planets that are uh, Goldilocks planets that are just right. Um, well, I know they want to move us eventually. Yeah, yeah. They want because the Earth is dying. Right. Like, we know that all right. planets die. Right. But there's, I think they're also looking for a species that's similar to ours. Um, and the reason being is that they're, they're looking for the potential of, uh, what's a good way of putting this, Bruiser? They're, they're looking for a, a species that might have seeded the earth. So okay. in other words, maybe we're not originally from here. And they're looking for... Um, they're looking for our our Where father or mother race. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So th th I think yeah, another yeah. thing too is human human. Uh, how should I put this? Human action is that we always want to be the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And if there's other species or whatever non-humanoid aliens they might be smarter than us. And I don't think us as humans can accept that fact, especially when you're talking scientists. You know, mm -hmm. scientists love being the smartest guy in the room. Very few don't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if they're looking, I think that's why they're looking for the, like you said, our our mother and father, you know what I mean? And ignoring the diamond-crusted, gold-fused aliens. Yeah, because I, it, I think it's, not that it's easy enough to find other 
aliens out there because it's <laughs> obviously it hasn't been. <laughs> um, it's not like they're flying around waving at satellite cameras and, and saying, hey, we're over here. Um, but I think that they're looking for a specific type of alien. And that's that why they're sense. looking for Goldilocks planets. They're looking for the the alien that's most palatable for the the world, not just the American public, but for the world. So they can hold them up and say, hey, we found an alien species that looks like us. Yeah. And I How think, funny would it be that if, when, I'm not even going to say if, when we find an alien species, they educate us on how many different type of alien species there are in the universe. And, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like if there's actually a friendly exchange between the yeah. two races. Yeah, like a Starfleet command or just to use layman's terms. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Yeah. we could be, you know, it could almost be like, what if we're the last ones of the party? You know, because we're so nitpicky as to what we're looking for. Yeah. Because like you said, how'd you put the Goldilocks planet? That's what we're looking for. Yeah. But there could be this whole network. You oh, know what I'm I mean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think I think there is. I think there's a whole network of alien beings out there. I don't know if they work together or know each other. I don't know. Because – and the reason I say that was because every time we have a UAP report, there are always different shaped objects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, for a while it was always saucers or this. But look at the Tic Tac video. Yep. You know, the Tic Tac yep. video was different from the other video, yep. which is different from what we reported on last week. So like – how do we know those aren't different species coming to visit us? And they just may be. Yeah. But I think with all those different species that are coming to visit us, I think that the scientists at NASA are looking for, uh, again, for lack of a better term, they're looking for the, the brother, sister, one, the ones is, that are closest to us. Is it like they're looking for our origin story almost? Yeah. Yeah. To, to say, because the religious view is we came from Adam and Eve. The scientific view is the Big Bang. You know what I mean? The evolution. It's, I think if they find this other race, they can go, this is where humans came from. It's easier to sell to a, a general public to say, hey, we found an alien race and they look just like us. And hey, yeah. you know what? We can tie it into, we can tie it into religion. We can tie it into everything. And that maybe, just maybe, there's a reason why God made them or made us. Maybe we were made off planet and we were brought here. And we were yeah. brought here by God. And we can tie it all together. And, and it can all make sense. As opposed to selling you a story about how we came from uh, alien greys or reptilians. or that That's not sellable to our public. Right. So you, you find something that looks like us. And, and you have to get a story, too, that encompasses all beliefs. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You have to get the religious side and the scientific side. Because mm-hmm. that's always been the battle. I mean, since the beginning of time, it's always been religion versus science. Always. You know? Mm-hmm. And, so, and you, can, you can explain, in a way, you can explain that well, it can be explained. It, it can it can be explained from a theological point of view that there's one God, one source, but there's many roads to get there. Yep. And through individual customs and ind- individual beliefs, uh, those stories all eventually do lead to one source. Right. And and explain to people that y- you all do believe in the same source, but again, those individuals stories get there um that would be the only shake-up theologically that that people would would get but again we're getting deep into the weeds but we, we are we are but, but it's just it's always something that's crossed my mind is is nasa's or the scientists are always looking for humanoid style like what if we broaden that let's look for something that can survive on on venus you know yeah we can't you no, know no. and we're gonna have to develop technology to to survive, to, to explore. Cause we can't send a, a, a man there or a woman there. 
but you know, we'd have to send a robot that doesn't get destroyed by the right. diamond rain or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. But I think the whole reason they're looking for a humanoid race is because eventually you have to send an emissary out to meet them or they, they send an emissary out to meet us. Yeah. And eventually there has to be contact between the two parties and then a relationship has to form between the two parties. That's ultimately what you're looking at. You're not looking at um, a negative contact between the two parties. No, no, it's got it. They, of course, we'd want it to be positive because we don't know anything about them. Right. So, and then in that, you're looking at a, you know, a, a trade, trade of some sort. And then you're looking at, you know, positive relationships and things, you know, happening from there. And then in order to introduce it to our public and, and have it be palatable for our public, you have to explain how they formed or how they, their origin story, and then figure out how it ties into us. And I guess it would be easier to give to the public someone that looks like us than a giant scale covered yes. flesh eating monster. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> so that's, that's why I think that's why they, um, that's why they do it the way they do. So, yeah. so that's what they're looking for there. Um, one more story before we go to break here and it, uh, it is out in space. I don't know if, uh, this past, um, this past weekend, if you saw it or felt it at all, but there was an asteroid, the size of the great pyramid of Giza that, uh, skirted by the earth. I don't know if you, uh, you saw it go by at all. No, I didn't see. No, I didn't. No. Normally I hear about like, cause they normally make an announcement. You can go out and see it. Yeah, normally they say, hey, go out and take a look. Uh, you'll see that big uh, big uh, asteroid uh, flying by. Uh, but an asteroid uh, the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza flew by our planet at a close distance over the weekend. The asteroid, which NASA dubbed 2022 GU6. Uh, <laughs> Great came, name. Yeah, I know. It's, it's memorable. It, it just rolls off the tongue. Uh, it's called Gertrude. Yeah, Gertrude, yes, that's a better <laughs> name. Uh, came within 750,000 miles of Earth on Sunday uh, in the morning. It was Sunday Ooh. morning, coming down, have a cup of coffee, just sit out there and watch it burn by. Uh, NASA's calculations uh, were made by its Center for Near-Earth Object Studies. Uh, scientists say that while it was a relatively close approach, there was no chance that uh, that space rock was going to hit Earth. I think that's why it didn't make more headlines. Yeah, because it wasn't dire need. Yeah. Uh, the asteroid flew by our planet at three times the average distance between Earth and its natural satellite, the moon. Uh, it traveled at a speed of around 18,000 miles per hour, or 20 times the speed of sound, and nine times as fast as a rifle bullet. Ooh, that thing was trucking. Yeah, it was moving along. Uh, data indicated that the asteroid measured between 216 feet and 492 feet across, which would make it larger than the 415-foot-tall Great Pyramid of Giza. By contrast, the Washington Monument is 554 feet tall. Oh, wow. That tells you how big the thing was. Um, so far, if this, this is the sort of stuff that keeps you up at night. <laughs> so I'll throw this at you. NASA scientists have identified more than 29,000 near-Earth objects. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. There's most, a lot of stuff passing us. Yeah, most of which are small asteroids. They include more than 100 comets Okay. that are around our Earth at any one time. Uh, NEOs, as, as they're affectionately called, uh, that measure more than 460 feet in diameter, and fly within 4.6 million miles of Earth are categorized as potentially hazardous, but experts say that none of these objects have any chance of colliding with Earth over the next 100 years. You can rest easy there. Last month, NASA monitored a huge asteroid bigger than the Empire State Building as it flew at Earth at a distance of 3.5 million miles away. So there you go. Still, that's, that's amazing how much stuff is flying around up there. That's a little close for comfort. I'm just, just now, do they sad. consider space garbage stuff that flies close to us? Because there's a lot of space garbage up there. That is considered, well, it's... it's or is that an orbit? That's an orbit, but it's not considered, not, not a threat like this is considered. Gotcha. If something as big as this were to hit the, the Earth, it would change. It would change stuff considerably. It would be in, like a nuclear fallout. Um, well, it wouldn't necessarily. I mean, I'm saying like the 
impact and the the impact would the would, wave uh, would take out that, the would take out wave a, yeah it would take out a small country yeah yeah it's 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 that that big so call Bruce Willis get him up there. <laughs> <laughs> our break when we come back uh we've got other fun stories we're going to talk about the science behind why people see ghosts and demons we'll talk about a demon drummer i mean that's a natural follow-up right uh we'll oh, talk God, yeah yeah uh, we'll talk uh as well about uh a, a saucer shaped craft that collects lightning during a thunderstorm in missouri um and then we'll get into some fun stuff as well love potions may become a reality bruiser <laughs> For those Ooh. of you out there that may be lacking a significant other, you may be able to get one. Love potion number nine. Exactly. We'll talk about that when we come back. It's a Supernatural News Wednesday right here on the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Supernatural News Wednesday on Darkness Radio. Welcome back to Darkness Radio. It's a Supernatural News Wednesday here in the best in paranormal podcasting. Tim Dennis and Beer City Bruiser with you here on Supernatural News Wednesday. Bruiser. Yes. I'll tell you what, um, we have uh, some interesting stories here having to do with ghosts, demons, and the supernatural. And why or why not you may believe in that sort of stuff. Do you think there's a scientific reason why we believe in this stuff, first of all? I think it's um, humans are curious by nature. Oh. And when it's something we don't understand, we want to find out and we want to know more. Um, I, just, I think it's human nature to be curious. I mean, you're constantly – think about every day you're learning something. And I think the uh, the supernatural and the paranormal uh, scratch that itch because we don't know what it's like after you pass. We don't know – what it's like um, as far as heaven and hell. So mm -hmm. we're curious. So this is according to uh, scientists. It says, does it take a specific type of brain to experience paranormal anomalies? Some scientists think so, but that can go two ways. On one hand, researchers specialized in para parapsychology, the psychological study of the paranormal, have spent decades studying whether and how these anomalies exist in nature outside the human body and how some people might be more prone to experiencing them. More specifically, they want to know if some people have unique abilities, and that's in quotes, uh, that allow them to, say, see ghosts, spirits, and any other entities that might exist outside, the outside of the person experiencing it, i.e. not in their mind. On the other hand, skeptical scholars from the field of neuroscience and cognitive psychology have been trying to show that it's more about how some people process reality subjectively in their brain. Some people might just be wired to produce these experiences in their mind, even though they may not be real. While you might assume that parapsychology revolves around ghostbusters, spoon bending, and levitating magicians, that's not exactly the case. Parapsychology, also called psi, is an academic branch of psychology studied in universities and research facilities across the globe. Scientists from this field believe more academic, experimental, theoretical, and analytical research will show that what science knows about uh, the nature of the universe is largely incomplete. There's more than enough data and research at this point to make a reliable claim that oddities to mainstream science do in fact occur. Brian Laith, director of the Institute for the Study of Religious and Anomalous Experience and member of the Parapsychological Association, told the Daily Beast, in fact, there's more than a century's worth of peer-reviewed research on the topics. Laith said that it's statistically unlikely that the hundreds of PhDs producing said research are all fraudulent or incomplete, where people fight over what people fight over is the meaning and interpretation of those findings, which in bulk are theology and philosophy driven as opposed to issues of analytical science. Yet critics argue that parapsychology procedures and methods aren't in line with rigorous scientific standards. Uh, the results are just too flimsy and crucially that many of these experiments aren't replicable 
uh, which cuts at the core of how science is validated. And there's one big issue that persists. There are no valid theories to support most of the findings. Some theories are more based in physics. Others are focused on consciousness. But parapsychologists are having a hard time finalizing which ones explain it all. Of course, this often happens across all scientific disciplines, Lath notes, but skeptics disagree. We need parapsychology because if there were telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, pre, or precog precognition, ghosts, and any of these things, then science has to be radically overthrown. Susan Blackmore, visiting psychology professor at the University of Plymouth and parapsychologist turned skeptic, told the Daily Beast, I'm glad there are other people doing it. And then, of course, I'm not terribly surprised. They don't find any reliable findings. They don't find or they don't have any theory that works. They don't have any findings that contribute to any kind of theoretical progress. So they're always just kind of asking the same question. Uh, there's a lot of value in learning and understanding what these experiences are like for people, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an already existing medical explanation which can justify them. That's what Michael Van Elk, a professor of cognitive psychology at Leiden University in the Netherlands, is taking a stab at. The self-described humble skeptic has a lab focused on cognitive differences that he believes are at the basis of why people believe and experience the paranormal. According to his research, paranormal believers are more inclined to trust their intuition and emotions and are less guided by analytical reflection. They appear to perceive more illusor illusory agents in random motion displays, meaning that they might have a bias to seeing shapes and objects where there aren't ones. And we identified that paranormal believers had a stronger self-attribution bias, where in a random card guessing game, they are more often to take credit or were the, more often took credit uh, for positive outcomes, which are in fact caused by chance than skeptics. Uh, Van Elk told the Daily Beast, these findings fit with the broader view that paranormal believers are prone to a range of cognitive biases, but at the same time that these biases may be well adaptive for fostering mental health and self-esteem. Charlotte Dean, a, researchers at, a researcher at the Department of Psychology at the University of Hertfordshire in the UK, recently published a meta-analysis of 71 studies over the past three decades that explored links between belief in paranormal phenomena and cognitive function. Most of the findings are in line with the hypothesis that experiencing paranormal activity is linked to specific cognitive traits. Dean told that to the Daily Beast. So it seems there, Bruiser, that uh, sciences are in different camps. They seem to believe that either it's implanted in your mind or you have a precognition or, or, or prerequisite to uh, either believe that it's there or uh, you simply are wired that way. Yeah, I, I get it. I get why there's two. There's always going to be two camps and everything, but how I'm curious as to how they can explain then if you and I, obviously you and I must be wired the same way because we have similar beliefs, but let's take that. Well, let's take my wife, for instance, who is a skeptic, who, who doesn't, but she's also a sensitive. Mm -hmm. Is her wiring the same as ours, but she's fighting the wiring according to them? You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She is a sensitive, so she does know. But that's just where I'm, I'm curious. Like, I, I'm curious what tests they run, you know, like, because how can you get a group of people go to go on an investigation and obviously they all have different brain patterns or whatnot. But if they all experience the same thing, you know, for instance, two shades and a haircut, you know, da, 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 da. what if we all heard it? Does that mean now we're all wired the same way? You get what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with that? Like, yeah. How do you get a group of people and something happens we can't explain? Are we all predisposed? is what they're saying is like, Oh, well then you're all predisposed to that. And that's what I'm, you know what I mean? Like that's where I think the science is kind of screwed up. I think, and I know science isn't like, uh, they want everything explained. Obviously that's why it's science, but yeah. like, why can't there be, you know, why can't we have paranormal experiences and they happen because there is something on the other side, you know, you see where I'm going with this? Like, yeah, I do. The, the other thing that kind of, 
grabs me where I live, I guess, is is the the fact that they say, well, your brain is wired one way or another. You either have this this ability to tap into uh, this thing or you don't. But then think of it this way. You have people who are, I guess, have the precognition for this stuff or they don't. But how do you explain an investigator who uh, may have a precognition for this thing, but then over time as they're investigating, say, 10, 15 years, and they have the ability to turn it off right? in order to be skeptical. So they might hear a bump or a bang or, a, or like you said, a shave and a haircut knock, yep. but they're able to suppress that in order to debunk first and then worry about what that is. So they suppress the startle. They suppress the dude run aspect of things right. in order to figure out, okay, what was that? They, they start looking around at different factors first, different mm-hmm. earthly factors before they can, you know, say that something's paranormal. Um, there's a, there's a certain amount of nature versus nurture when it comes to, you know, is this really what it is? Right. Um, and I think there's, there's, you know, sure you can be wired a certain way, but then there comes a time where you go, you know what, um, is this really, is this really what you are? I believe that at certain times you can change the nature of what you are. Um, I, I think you're constantly changing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I hate when they say you're wired a certain way because, that changes over time. Like you just said, that, that, that seasoned investigator who's been investigating for years, you know, 20, 30 years. And then one day they, what they, their wiring screwed up is what these people are. You know what I mean? Like, right. Yeah. I, I get where you're, you know what I mean? Like, I agree with you. Like, and then in the, in the other case, you get someone who maybe is dead as a doornail when it comes to seeing spirits and, and whatnot. And they start, investigating and they say, well, I'll never see anything. I haven't seen anything. And the more they get out there and the more they get exposed to uh, paranormal investigating, the more they start seeing. Right. And it's a matter of just getting out there and experiencing. It's just, it's kind of dipping a toe in the water and the more they get out there and the more they get exposed to paranormal investigating and getting immersed in paranormal investigating, the more they start to see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, I don't think that, there's necessarily one stigma or another. I agree with that. You know, I don't know that, that science can just sit there and say, well, you know, we think we got to figure it figured out. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's either one or the other and, and you got to live with one or the other and that's it. Well, and you got to think too, how parapsychology when it first came about was not an accepted practice. You know what I mean? Like, if you think about how far paranormal investigating has come in the last hundred years. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until recently that you could get degrees in that. You know what I mean? Like, that you were accepted among the scientific community as a parapsychologist. Oh, you were you were a pariah, yeah, if you, you were. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And now that there's studies coming out, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's that's – that might factor into this study too, because you got the old guard that are like, well, a parapsychologist, he's just, that's nothing but hoo-ha, you know? And then you got the modern people are like, well, wait a minute, let's give them a chance, but we can explain why, because humans are wired. To, you know what I mean? Like yeah. they're accepting it with, not with prejudice, but with like, we'll accept it, but this is what we're going to accept along with that yeah. options. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just I always tell whenever I meet a scientist or something that's oh no, no no okay come on an investigation and watch how we investigate if, if you know we hear a bump we go figure out why why did that bump happen you know you you debunk it and if we can't do that what's the scientific explanation you heard the bump you're not wired the way I am you, you know what I mean like yeah then explain to me what's the scientific explanation. Well, yeah, that drives, that drives I had that drives science people nuts. I've I've done that to numerous people. Yeah, and it's a it's a a matter of you know why 
Yeah, and there's 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 scientific method, and there's a there's a, and keep in mind, most investigators don't use scientific method when they no when you they can't. yeah so so you can't um, for 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 lack of a better term, you can't you can't say that investigators use scientific method when they investigate. Some do a a, a fair amount do, but but not a lot of investigators use true scientific method because you can't close off um, uh, you can't close off a building especially if you're doing a, a public place um, oh yeah you, you can't close off a, a, a public place and do um, and use scientific method in, in my, my old roommate was was like that where he he doesn't believe in the paranormal because there's no way of actually getting true scientific and i, and I asked him one day i said why he goes well think about it you if you're in a public school that was haunted and that's what you're investigating you can't make a five block radius where no one can be inside there yeah you know you, you can't so how do you know it's not an outside and i was like okay that makes sense mm-hmm it's a, it's definitely an interesting topic, that's for sure. Well, from uh, believing in ghosts and demons to a story of the demon drummer of Tedworth. <laughs> Figure we'll change the subject here. Um, exploring the truth behind the story. As a species, mankind has always been obsessed with things that go bump in the night, uh, whether it is uh, or whether it be around a campfire, written down in a book, or shown on the big screen. We've been telling each other spooky tales for thousands of years. The 17th century case of the demon drummer of Tedworth may be Britain's earliest recorded ghost story, and many believe it is true. Uh, the demon drummer of Tedworth is often... Didn't he play with Ozzy a few years ago? He did, yes, actually. He had to, <laughs> he had to retire from Carpal Tunnel, I believe. Is oh, what it was. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Those demons. You know, you know they, even they uh, succumbed to, to uh, Carpal Tunnel. You just can't help it when you're, de- when you're drumming with Ozzy, that's for sure. <laughs> um, the uh, demon drummer of Tedworth is often attributed to as uh, being the uh, first recorded encounter with a poltergeist in England. A poltergeist, by definition, is a type of ghost responsible for physical disturbances they tend to make loud noises, move objects, and generally make a huge nuisance of themselves. Uh, most cultures seem to have some version of poltergeist folklore, and there are records of poltergeist activity dating back to the first century AD. However, stories of poltergeist activity became much more common during the 17th century. And why? Well, the popularity of the drummer of Tedworth probably had something to do with it. Well, you know, that drummer of Tedworth, he was something else. Yeah, he um, sold out every week. He did. He's, he'd <laughs> sell out every night, brother, I'll tell you that. Yep. Uh, details vary from account to account, and the tale has likely been sensationalized uh, both at the time and since. The story goes something like this. In 1661, John Mompesson, uh, who was, for ease's sake, we'll refer to as a magistrate here, was visiting... I believe it's Lud, Ludgerson, or no, Ludgers Hall. That's what it is, Ludgers Hall. And I'll get, I'm sure, emails on my pronunciation. <laughs> In Wiltshire, England. While there, uh, he ran across a local vagrant, homeless man, called William Drury. Uh, there had been so many complaints, or there had been many complaints in the area, that Drury had been annoying the locals. Uh, Drury had been playing his drum nonstop and begging for money. Kind of like downtown Minneapolis, down by Target. So. <laughs> I was at uh, we stopped at a store the other day. There was a guy outside playing his guitar with a tip jar. Yeah, yeah, I don't see, think he was a vagrant. I think he was just performing. Yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Nope, he wasn't uh, a demon. Well, he, he might have been. He might have been. Well, if he was been that crossroads. It was at a crossroads. Oh, see, he might have been Robert Johnson. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mompesson got himself involved, and upon confronting Drury, discovered that Drury's busking permit was fake. <laughs> well, that'll happen. As you got to make some money, leave them alone. As a direct result of this, the local bailiff took away Drury's drum, and uh, the whole case never went to court. After doing his good deed for the day and taking away a homeless man's livelihood, Mompesson <laughs> went home to Tedworth. Unfortunately for him, when he got home, he found that the bailiff had, for some unknown reason, forwarded the drum to Mompesson's home. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Uh, what follows is your classic spooky story. The haunting started with scary noises. The family was plagued by strange knocks and bangs and, of course, ghostly drumming. Boo, kids. Uh, as time went on, the haunting appeared to intensify. After a month of near-constant haunting, the family was suitably terrified. Mompasson uh, had tried to chase away the ghost with a pistol. Of course, that works every time. <laughs> Uh, but unsurprisingly, that hadn't worked. Things became more sinister, however, when the haunting began to focus on Mompasson's children's room. A loud screeching came from under their beds. The beds themselves would shake, and worst of all, the children would begin to levitate several feet above their beds. On one occasion, yeah, on one occasion, six men endeavored to hold the children down, but to no avail. This haunting went on for two years. The demon or poltergeist had in some way a short attention span. While seemingly tied to the house, it soon moved on to Mompus and staff. Uh, objects would levitate around them. The children would then be levitated from their beds or even pinned to their beds, unable to move. As time went on, the haunting appeared to become more mischievous. People's bedclothes would be pulled down while they slept, and <laughs> objects would be moved around rooms. But the worst of the haunting seemed to have been abated. Of course, this being the 17th century, Mompasson got a priest involved, backed up by some very sleep-deprived neighbors. The incessant drumming meant no one was getting any sleep. The priest supposedly found that when they all prayed, the sounds and the drumming would stop. But as soon as the praying stopped, the noises would come back worse than ever. It would seem that the de demon drummer of Tedworth wasn't a fan. Uh, <laughs> now, here are the theories. <clears throat> Theory one, Drury the wizard. At the time, Drury received the blame. He would eventually admit to having essentially cursed Mompasson. He claimed that the haunting was his revenge for Mompasson confiscating his drum and his livelihood. If Mompasson would only return his drum, the haunting would stop. If we take this line into thinking, then the demon drummer is no poltergeist, but some kind of curse or demon. It's a uh, dislike for priests and habit of hiding Bibles would support this. Even Drury was tied to a wizard or was tried as a, oh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Eventually Drury was tried as a wizard and convicted as was the English habit at the time. He was shipped off to one of the colonies, which was Pennsylvania. Uh, it appears that around the same time, the haunting finally came to a stop. Oh, oh okay. that's all it took. Sent him to Pennsylvania. <laughs> Theory two is that it was a hoax. The prevalent theory, however, is that demons don't exist and that the demon drummer of Tedworth was just a hoax. Some experts at the time, such as Joseph Glanville, a clergyman and proto-demonologist, blamed the children. It's thought that since the majority of the hauntings happen in the children's room and kids will be kids, that they did it. <laughs> hey, we can get mom and dad. Follow me on this one. Uh, the rest can be chalked up to good old-fashioned hysteria and religious fervor. Or was it Drury's pals helping to get his revenge? It is thought that perhaps Drury got some old buddies in on the prank, and they all made it their life's mission to, ru uh, to ruin Mompasson's life for a couple of years. A final theory is that it was gypsies either playing a prank or harnessing some of that terrifying gypsy mad magic. Uh, around the same time as the hauntings began, Mompasson had roy royally irritated a local group of gypsies after <laughs> having one of their band arrested. This guy's all about getting vagrants just arrested. I hey, guess. You're a musician? Yeah. You're arrested. You're arrested. Are you a gypsy? You're arrested. Uh, who or what was really responsible? Well, as is so often the case with history, we're dealing with a whole lot of unreliable witnesses here. Many of them were scared out of their minds. Some of them were were deeply religious, and some of them were probably trying to make a quick buck. If you want to believe the story of the demon drummer of Tedworth, well, go ahead. Uh, it says here in the article, for my money, it sounds very much like Mompasson had a habit of annoying those less fortunate uh, for himself. Uh, the writer of the article says, I have a feeling that as the story spread more and more, people who had grievances against him decided to scare him and his family, whether that be a poor drummer boy a band of gypsies, his long-suffering staff, or even his own daughters. So there you go. That's a great story. I think I think it's a combination of one and three. Uh, what if the guy was a gypsy and he cursed? Because he said he was tried for being a wizard. Yeah. 
gypsies, gypsies, gypsies. You don't mess with gypsies, no. especially back then. No, you don't. You don't. Uh, we go from uh, we go from a demon drummer to a saucer shaped craft that collects lightning during a thunderstorm filmed in Missouri. <laughs> you think they tour together? Do you think the the saucer is the the lighting guy? The demon it, drummer is the main it, event. It could and then your be. your saucer guy is the, the guy who's lightening he's, it up. And, he's got the light show going. Yeah, he's got yeah. the pyro going. He's got the lights, all of it. That'd be perfect. I'd, <laughs> I'd pay a little bit of bucks to go see that show. Coming soon to a town near you. The only problem demon is... Demon drummer and lightning orb. <laughs> and lightning boy. Um, <laughs> the lightning alien and the drummer boy. The demon drummer boy. Um, it turns out... Uh, the only problem is there's about... Uh, what, there's about 400 years separating the two of them? True. Yeah. And a big, giant ocean. And a big, giant ocean. There's that. Uh, during a severe electrical storm that happened on June 7th in St. Joseph, Missouri, a photographer, uh, while filming the thunder and lightning, noticed a huge saucer-shaped object in the center of the thunderstorm. Well, that's a little unusual. Uh, the object appears to have a strange antenna on top of it that collects lightning. Since it seems that the vapor clouds are influenced by the shape of the object, we can suppose that the object is not a natural cloud, but a solid craft uh, that are uh, created by intelligent design, whether man-made or of alien origin, it says here. This wasn't the first time a UFO was caught during a lightning storm. Back in 2017, a UFO was caught on camera uh, when it was hit by a gigantic lightning strike in the U.S., it is often said that UFO use lightning to recharge their batteries. And then the question is ra raised, could these images be proof of it? Footage of the uh, thunderstorm with saucer-shaped craft starts at about the 305 mark of the video that's in this article. Um, it just proves that we're nothing but a rest stop for them. I guess <laughs> they so. stop and fuel up and go. They stop, fuel up, and go. Um it's kind of interesting. I'll see if I can I can get this picture. It's it's the it's the image. The uh, video image is actually kind of interesting. Can you see that craft shape and then the lightning bolt hitting it? Yeah, that's, that's bigger than I thought it would be. Yeah, that's not a little saucer either. That's a no. That's a big saucer. See, when I when you said a little saucer, I thought oh, it's off in the distance. No, he's yeah. right there. Yeah, that fills up the whole frame. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. It's it's a it's a pretty large saucer, and you can clearly see a lightning bolt hitting the top of the surface of the saucer so it's interesting nonetheless yeah but right yeah, normally there, when you see the saucer pictures are they're, they're off in the distance so they're you can't really gauge how big they are unless it's a landmark this is yeah it's pretty this good is size. a saucer <laughs> yeah it's a pretty good size pretty good size yeah that's good footage yeah uh let's move on netflix is developing a ghostbuster series oh yeah great movie and the the I don't know if you've seen the new one, The Afterlife, but that was really good, too. Yeah. This is an animated series, however, okay. according to Variety. Jason Reitman and Gil Keenan, or yeah, it's Gil Keenan, uh, are executives producing the series for Ghost Corp Incorporated, working with Sony Pictures Animation. Reitman and Keenan co-wrote the most recent Ghostbusters movie, like uh, Bruiser was saying, Ghostbusters Afterlife, which Reitman also directed. Netflix is still... Uh, keeping pilot details confidential for now. And the show does not have a writer attached yet. Netflix and Ghost Corps Incorporated, based out of Columbia Pictures, will work together on the show's production. The news comes on the annual Ghostbusters Day celebration, marking the latest anniversary of the original Ghostbusters movie. Assuming it makes it to release, the Ghostbusters show will be the third cartoon based on the original films from the 1980s. The first was The Real Ghostbusters, which debuted in 1986. It continued the adventures of the original Ghostbusters characters over 140 episodes syndicated through 1991. Extreme Ghostbusters followed in 1997 with Egon Spengler, uh, leading a brand new cast of characters for 40 episodes. Ghostbusters began with the 1984 film, of course, directed by Jason Reitman's father, uh, Ivan Reitman. And uh, we all know about that film. It was starred uh, Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis. They Do you remember the why the cartoon was called The Real Ghostbusters? I don't know if you know this. No. Do you, so there was another cartoon at the time called Ghostbusters. And it was a, a group of teenagers. That kind of, it was kind of like a Scooby Doo, but they did it with ghosts and stuff. And they had a, instead of a dog, they had a big giant gorilla. Hmm. And that had come out before 
I want to say it came out before the movie came out, but I might be wrong. Mm-hmm. I know our listeners will correct me on that. But because it was already out, they had to change the cartoon for the Ghostbusters into the real Ghostbusters. Oh, okay. And they aired right after each other on Saturday mornings. Really? Okay. Well, there you go. See, Mom, me wasting all that time indoors watching cartoons helped in my life. <laughs> it was useful <laughs> after all. Um, the Ghostbusters aren't done in live action either. It turns out after the success of Ghostbusters Afterlife, the studio announced plans for a follow-up. Sony Pictures chairman Tom Rothman uh, confirmed that the studio will pursue further sequels. Uh, Yes, we will, he told Deadline. We have plenty of franchise universes with which to operate in. But since I have Deadline here, I want to say, and please include this, okay? Everyone will say, yeah, you did $3 billion, but it's all sequels and superheroes. It was not all that. There was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Little Women, this summer, we got Bullet Train with David Leitch with Brad Pitt, a pure original R-rated Rock'em, rock'em Sock'em action movie for grown-ups, and Where the Crawdads Sing. He's really going on a tangent here. Yeah. Uh, big bestseller with an up-and-coming actress, da- Daisy Edgar-Jones, for women. I absolutely believe that women will come back to our box office. Um, so there you go. He says there's, uh, Tom Rothman says there's another uh, Ghostbusters sequel in the works. As Good. Well for, Can't go wrong with the Ghostbusters series yep, for the uh, for the box office. So there you go. And if you haven't seen Ghostbusters Afterlife, I recommend it highly. It is especially if you are a fan of the first two. There you go. There you go. Uh, Bruiser, guess what? Love potions could soon be a reality. <laughs> this doesn't speak trouble at all. No, no, no. <laughs> there aren't skeevy uh, perverts out there that would use this to their advantage at all. No, nobody took a fun drug and turned it into a roofie at all, did they? No. <laughs> Let me tell you something there, Bruiser. <laughs> With them putting pups in the roofies. Rudy, go fetch me my love potion number nine now. <laughs> Uh, experts predict that drugs will replicate the effect of falling head over heels and they could be available in three to five years. Mm. They provide a fabled boost to romance and feature in comic twists in Harry Potter and Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now experts say real love potions could be available within three to five years. Uh, (laughs) Drugs which spark romance may include the cuddle hormone oxytocin, (laughs) while low-dose ecstasy could help couples fall back in love. A form of antidepressant may be given to lovers who have been dumped. Oh, God, this is so scary. So no more will the wife have a headache. (laughs) No, not possible at all. Uh, Anthropologist Dr. Anna Machen, or Machen, of uh, Oxford University said certain drugs can replicate the effect on the brain of falling in love. She told Cheltenham Science Festival, there are lots of ethical questions, but love drugs are certainly on the horizon. She added, She's, we know enough now about the neurochemistry of love to probably suggest some things you could take to enhance your abilities to find love or to increase the possibilities that you will stay in love when it gets a little bit tricky. And so cert- Viagra, Blue Chew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blue Chew. <laughs> Do the old Bruce Buffer thing. Blue Chew. <laughs> uh, and certainly one of the frontiers of love research commercially, can you imagine how much money you make, is in exploring these possible love drugs. That was a quote from her, by the way. Does anybody else see a problem with this? <laughs> oh, I see huge problems with it. This is this is a whole. Do you know what this is, Tim? What you're what you're the story that you're telling us right now is a future episode of Law and Order SVU. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dun dun. dun. Yeah. Uh, potions are featured in Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince, where they make Ron Weasley fall madly in love in a mid uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> Having a hard time reading it. Titania, Queen of the Fairies, is given an aphrodisiac with hilarious results. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, they were even the subject of a huge hit by the searchers in 1964, Love Potion Number 9. Uh, speaking after the talk, Dr. Machin said, Love drugs used in couples therapy could be available within three to five years. Oxytocin could be available within a decade for people to squirt up their nose before they go out on a Saturday night. 
At the same Isn't time, that called cocaine. I think so. Yes, it is. <laughs> At the same time as a glass of prosecco, uh, she added, "There are more ethical questions surrounding MDMA or ecstasy, so that is likely to take longer." Uh, levels of oxytocin to increase in the human body or, or during hugging, uh, Dr. Machin, who has written a book called Why We Love, said it could help people become more confident when dating and help them fall in love, which... Uh, you start, you're starting your relationship off of a lie, basically. Yeah, so you take this oxytocin or whatever it is you're yep. taking, and maybe you're not so much into the person, but you're artificially feeling something for him because you took a pill. And what if that person doesn't feel the same way about you? Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. are they going to create a pill that takes it away? Is there going to be a no pill? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's why this is bad. Uh, they, yeah. He, he, they said it in there, MDMA, the ethics. Well, yeah, because people use MDMA as a, a date rape drug. It's a, it's a roofie, a roofie. Yeah. It, you know, yes, it was created for something else, which is great. The, the person that created these love potions, they have something else in mind, which is awesome. Good. You're thinking of that, but you're not considering a complete jerk, <laughs> you know, a narcissistic yeah. serial killer jerk taking these drugs. Yeah. And then, then you've got complications like relationships that really should move on. You've got someone who's stuck on somebody else and one person wants to move on that person who's stuck on that other person Decides they want to slip something into that person's drink to try and get them to fall back in love with them again. How many times have we done stories of stalkers? Yes. Because they were in love with somebody, but that person had no idea they existed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just... Now you're feeling that rage? Yeah. No, 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 no. There's just, uh, there's just some things we need to leave alone in this. And and there's times it it sucks but we've all been through it where you've been in a relationship that turns toxic and it's better to let the relationship die than continue on. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're constantly fueling yourself, how many people are going to associate then toxic relationships because they're feeling good with the oxytocin? You know what I mean? Yeah. So in their head, that's normal. That's what it is. When no, that's a toxic relationship. You need to get out of that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Scary stuff. Uh, Very scary. Let's change. Uh, let's change gears here. Um, you know, sometimes you're you're hit with a scary situation, Bruiser, and you just need that one tool in the toolkit to to drive whatever it is away. Yeah. I think I found the ultimate tool when you're in a scary situation with a potential spirit to drive it away. Is it a pistol? Because that's what the guy used in the 1700s. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, this is even better. Um, a music teacher may have led the way for us all. Okay. Okay. Um, but he proved it w with uh, a scenario with a bear this week. <laughs> so we know this repels bears is what yes. you're getting at. Yeah. Okay. A music teacher played a trombone to scare a bear away from his school. <laughs> I figure if it works with a bear, it's got to work with a spirit, right? Of course. Especially if I'm of picking course. up the trombone and playing it. Cause I don't play the trombone. My son used to play the trumpet, and we always laugh because uh, one day he came downstairs from his room, and he goes, man, our neighbors must really like the way I play. And my wife goes, well, why? Because I keep knocking on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> we said, yeah, you're going to practice in the basement from now on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. We couldn't break his spirit. You know what I no. mean? Yes, son, they're big fans, but yeah, you gotta... move to the basement. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's probably uh... why we didn't experience any spiritual energy in that house because of his trumpet, playing. his trumpet playing. See, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, You're right. Loud instrument does good. Uh, Tristan Clausen, a music teacher at St. John's Academy in Shenaugan Lake, uh, <laughs> said he was alerted to the presence of a bear shift, or sniffing around the wooden structure that houses the trash cans outside the school. Clausen said another teacher attempted to scare the bear away by banging on a door. That's not going to get it done. No, you got to you gotta get right up in there. Obviously, by what you told us about your son, banging on a, <laughs> anything is not going to get it done. Uh, I thought, well, I can do better than that and reach for my trombone and went out. <laughs> <laughs> a, a video recorded by a student shows the bear becoming startled by Clausen's playing and hurriedly leaving the area. <laughs> 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 
That sounds like you're strangling Yoda. <laughs> that was my bear running away. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> he had a lot of attention in my direction and was figuring out what to do and decided discretion was the better part of valor, he told Czech News. I'm trying not to take it personally. Well, evidently, the music teacher wasn't that great of a trombone player. No. Mm. You don't have to be great to scare him away. You just have to be... Well, yeah, you didn't know that that bear might have been a big jazz fan, and if he would have started playing a song, the bear would have danced a little, you know, a little yeah. jig. <laughs> da, da, you want to see? Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, that's my jam. Yeah, <laughs> play it loud. I'm gonna get some garbage. <laughs> he would have st- st- stood around just eating the garbage and watching yeah. the trombone player. But oh, you you guys had some pizza last night. I like that pizza. <laughs> That's my bear. That's your bear? Your bear That's is Louis bear. Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, play daddy <laughs> Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful world. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of how that one went. Um, how does it go along scaring spirits? Well, the, the bear's not a spirit. No, I know, but it's the same concept. Just extremely loud, annoying trombone playing is going to get rid of anything and make it to turn tail and run. That's why my ex-girlfriend never had any spirit relations. She was loud and annoying. See? <laughs> As in life, so is in death, Bruiser. If you didn't want to sit around and listen to a loud, noisy trombone in life, you're not going to want to do it in death. Gotcha. See? So I figured it out. Just figured I'd pass that one along. And finally today, this is our last story. Um, I figured we ended on food. Of course. Hence, I brought up cheeseburger. Yep. Okay. It turns out that uh, once a year down in Mexico, or okay. once a year in somewhere in the world, they try to assemble the world's biggest hamburger for, okay. for the Guinness Book of World Records. This year, they did it in Mexico. I think they did it last year in Mexico as well. Uh, two years ago, they tried to do it uh, in Germany. Oh, no, it was four years ago. Five years ago, they tried to do it in Germany. I know they did a pretzel in Germany. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then I think in Amsterdam, they did a THC-infused brownie. Oh, my God. It was, a really? 200, it was like a 200-pound or 500-pound THC-infused brownie that's in an, Amsterdam. That's enough to get a country high. <laughs> It's Ams- Amsterdam. <laughs> Jesus. How big was this burger? That Well, that beats my story. I think we can end it there. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Chefs assemble an over 600-pound hamburger in Mexico. What always in, always intrigues me about when they do this yeah. is how they cook this thing. I was going to say, how it, it's not like you can have it on the grill. It's not like you're in your backyard with your little Weber grill. <laughs> they managed to cook this thing in 10 minutes. Huh? Yeah. They have like a giant flamethrower or something? <laughs> oh, four it, guys with flamethrowers? <laughs> it's all done on one Weber. Um, <laughs> the, the chefs at the second annual uh, International Hamburger Festival in Mazatlan how, how, I hope it says how cooked it was, because if it's rare, it's that's real, fine. It's real rare. It's uh, real rare. Uh, they worked together during the event to cook the massive burger in about 10 minutes. How? <laughs> Blow dryers? <laughs> Blow dryers. <laughs> uh, organizers said the burger would be cut into portions and provided to local food charities. The burger was nearly double the size of a 343.9 pound hamburger created at last year's festival. I like how they're giving it to food charities, but that's going to go cold real quick. Well, I think you can reheat. I mean, you know. And, and what? Like, oh, well, yeah, I guess they're going to cut it up. I'm thinking like the up, whole burger yeah. itself. Like, what are you going to throw in a microwave? You, you just don't show up at the homeless shelter and drop 600 pounds of burger and say, have a nice day. <laughs> you could. You know, well, I don't think you do. But um, organizers said that this year's burger set a national record for Mexico, and they're making plans for next year's festival to feature a burger to beat the Guinness world record of 2,566 pounds, nine ounces, which was set in Germany in 2017. Now, what wow. I think they do is they, they, they take and they, they cut it up into sections and reassemble. Okay. To, to make it in 10 minutes. So there's, they're, they're separately all 
cooked in different areas and then they bring it together. So they, they fill a flat top full of meat. Yeah. Yeah. Grill that. And that, while that's going on, another guy's got the same amount. Yeah. His grill. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, they, I think that's how they do it. They get together, pull out the instructions from Ikea and reassemble. And then they all put it together. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's how they do it. I'm pretty sure that's how they do it. I don't know. I have to, I have to look at my, you know what? I, I think I may look it up while we're sitting here talking because no. it's, the, it's the only way to. No. Is it on a bun with ketchup, mustard, cheese, the works, or is it just the meat? I got to think it's just the, the meat. Because that, the, the bun brings in another thing. How are you making this bun? That's well, be a now, big bun. when they did the one in Germany, I think they made a custom bun. If I That's remember right. a huge right. oven. Well, no, because you, you can make it in sections for that, too. You could. Um, let's see here. I'm going to Google, how do you make a giant hamburger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. You're going to get so many pop-up ads. <laughs> I know. They're all going to be for McDonald's, too, I'm sure. Yep. Uh I have a, there's a YouTube, there's a guy with a YouTube channel out there who says he made a giant 30 pound burger. See, 30 pounds is okay. Like I could do 30 pounds, but 600 pounds of meat. That is just insane. Did you eat? What did you say? The German one's 2000 pounds? Yeah. 2,566 pounds, nine ounces. Was that with, now is that just the meat or is that the whole sandwich assembled? That's the meat. Jeez. Because if you're throwing on ketchup, mustard, lettuce, tomato, onion, bun, that's going to add some more weight. Could you could you eat a 30-pound burger? No. I don't know who eats that. Is that like a family thing? You, you just... It's got to be. My old roommate uh, ate a, what was it, five pounds? So it was a, a three-pound burger and two pounds of fries. And he got a free T-shirt. Jeez. Yeah. It was funny on the ride home. He was in a meat coma. It was like oh, I bet he was out. And I asked him, "I said, what was the worst part?" He said, "The fries." Oh yeah, yeah. The fries, the fries were, were the worst. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's never the meat. I mean, the the meat seems to they just don't have it in Google. We'll have to look it up on another show. Yeah. Um, I know people are on the edge of their seat right now, going, "How do you cook that much meat at one time?" Uh, There's a guy right now at the grocery store holding all this meat going, come on, Timmy, come through, Tim. How do I do, how do, I how do, I do this? this? And now he's putting all the meat back like, oh, I've man. Ordered, <laughs> I ordered 600 pounds of beef from the butcher. It's all your fault, Tim. <laughs> um, no, it, uh, but yeah, I, I, somebody out there must know too. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get. That, do you think? How many what? Cows. Because it's ground chuck, I'm assuming, right? It's got to be. So that's, that's got to be at least. It's all the cows in Mexico. It's not all the cows. <laughs> it's got to be at least 30 cows. And then can you imagine seasoning that? Because you got to season it. Salt and pepper. That's all it is. Yeah. So what? You mm -hmm. just go to the local quarry and ask for all the salt. To <laughs> A local quarry. <laughs> you walk up to Fred Flintstone. <laughs> hey, Fred. They want salt and pepper. Um. Yeah. I, <laughs> A local quarry. <laughs> Where they're farming rocks. <laughs> I was rocks thinking of salt, salt quarry, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> a local quarry. I love that. I saw it on Dirty Jobs where he went into a salt quarry and he essentially was harvesting salt. Mike Rowe, who, by the way, is one of our, uh, we, maybe we should get Mike Rowe on the show because he's on oh, audio boom here. That, Tim, you're playing with my emotions now. He, I am a, such a huge fan of Mike Rowe. I watched. Dirty Jobs. I used to watch the Bering Sea Gold. All the shows he he Ghost Hunters. He was the narrator for that. He, he he's just an amazing man. <laughs> I'm fanboying right now. I get it. We'll have to uh, we'll have to talk to our buddy Emily see if we can uh, either if we can uh, appear over on uh, Mike Rowe's show or if he can come over here. He's just that would be a dream. He is uh, yeah. Never thought it would happen. He's uh, he's an, a classically trained opera singer. Mm -hmm. He's a voiceover artist. Mm -hmm. He's a television artist. I mean, you name it. That's Mike Rowe. He's got a show here on Audio Boom, so we'll, uh, we'll have to see if we can hook something up. We'll talk to Emily. Yeah. Yeah. So 
<laughs> can Which, ask him if he can eat a 600 pound burger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, after, ask him how to cook a big burger. After you got to know from dirty jobs. After right? a hard day of hard work, can you eat a 600 pound burger micro? <laughs> and how many cows is that? Yep. And he's, what he's, do you do with the, what kind of bun? He's got to know what that is. You, oh you'd think. God. He knows everything. He does. Look at us, Joey. We mentioned in the last two days, Tim, we mentioned Joey Greco and Mike Rowe. Look at us. That's right. <laughs> Maybe we could get them both on the show at the same time. Oh, you're trying to kill me now. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get the this guests. Is, this, is, this would be me during the whole interview. <sighs> and then while we were sitting here, I got a I got a text from Katrina Weidman, and she had asked me if... Another one. Look at you. If uh, if Discovery Plus had ever gotten back to me about getting them on the show, getting her, uh, her and Jack Osborne on the show, and they hadn't, those dirty you-know-whats. That's so, an amazing show, by the way, fans. If you are a fan, yeah. um, Portals from Hell, Portals oh, to Hell portals is to amazing. Hell. Yep. yep. So, and I've been I've been chasing them since the season started, and Discovery Plus had been putting me off. And I so I I texted Katrina because she's a good friend of the show, and I said, Katrina, how come your uh, how come your people won't uh, let you come on my show? Yeah. And so uh, she said, uh, Well. They had been busy at the beginning because uh, there was a press release put out. But um, but she said, "All right, well, uh, you know, we'll keep uh, we'll keep pushing them, and and we want to come on the show." And she said, "Did they ever get back to you?" I said, "They haven't get, gotten back to me." So she's going to push and see if he if uh, at I'd least be curious to see on. if you can get Jack on with his schedule because he's got the Osbournes want to believe. He's got the portals from hell. He's got the uh, the show with the Ghost Brothers, and he's got he's got some major stuff going on at home. Not only that, but let's folks, let's send out some as we're closing up today. Let's send out some thoughts and prayers to Ozzy. Yes, because uh, he's having that surgery. You're yes, right. as we're recording this, Ozzy has had surgery today, and it's a major, major surgery. Um, it's going to affect his life, the rest of his life, and it yeah. may affect whether he records again or not. Uh, and so we want to send out uh, some some prayers for uh, Ozzy, some thoughts and prayers for Ozzy. Let's send out some thoughts and prayers for the rest of his family too, because they're they're uh, having a tough time with this as well. So we want to we want to uh, send out some thoughts and prayers for Jack and Kelly and, and Sharon and, and the rest of the family, um, because uh, Ozzy's uh, not in a good way right now. So we want to make sure he, that he he's pulls so his. influential in and in not just music. But yeah. pop culture as a whole. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, musically he's he's gifted, but just as pop culture as a whole, yeah. he's so influential. And and they're a tight family. Yeah. When you watch their stuff. Yeah. They're all a really close, tight family, which is hard when you're the celebrity that Ozzy is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, but not he, only not only that, but now, you know, Ozzy has grandkids, and you could tell he yep. absolutely loves those grandkids. And and yep. even if music went away tomorrow. You know, if, if music went away tomorrow for Ozzy and, and he never made another album, that's fine. Right. What what counts now is that Ozzy has grandkids and and you want him here to to have that precious time and to be able to be healthy to enjoy time with the grandkids. Agreed. You know, he's he's given us more than enough entertainment and, and he's you know, he's given us great great music, he's given us great entertainment on television. Um you know, he's um, given us it's all time of for us to give him all of our positive energy. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's, he's earned it. Yeah. So, uh, keep, keep Ozzy Osbourne in your thoughts and prayers, uh, uh, this week as, as he, uh, as he goes through uh, that, that surgery and that procedure and, and, um, and let's, let's wish him back to good health because that's, that's what, uh, that's what Ozzy needs. He needs a, he needs a break here. He needs a break. Uh, tomorrow, Karen Anderson, animal communicator. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, what life is is like when you have a gift, and believe it or not, you're shunned by not only your family but your colleagues. Karen Anderson has, really? yeah, Karen Anderson has these amazing gifts, yeah. and at one time she was a police officer. Oh, cool. Yeah, and uh, and she it was, should do a reading on my cat. He's been a complete asshole lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly enough, Bruiser, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about her story and uh, and how she formed a bond with animals and how you too can form a bond with your animals and get to know what they're thinking. 
All right. Yeah, so that's there that's he is right there. Look at you yeah, talking about you. He just came walking in like, "Hey, <laughs> hey, what's up?" Well, no, no, you're talking to a psychic. No, tomorrow, buddy. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to talk about animal communications tomorrow. I uh, I had a little bit of an incident here at the house. I believe I told you about with uh, yes, yeah, yeah. I was. You had a hectic incident. It wasn't even just a little. You. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay, so I. I will, this, is, this is worth telling the fans. They they need to know your. I I'll share it real quick because I don't know if I'm going to get to share it with Karen tomorrow, yeah. but I'll bring it up with Karen if I can tomorrow. But I'll share it with you guys real quick before we leave today. Um, so I'm uh, I'm I'm doing some laundry and I'm cleaning up a little bit uh, over the weekend. And um, as you know, we have the chipmunks. You know, out in the it's not Alvin and the chipmunks, but we've got you know chipmunks that we've domestically. I don't want to say trained because it's a bad. No, you just misnomer. you formed um, more than a human animal relationship. You actually have a you have a relationship with it. It's more than just a. Yeah. They're still wild animals. They're wild animals. They're not pets, but you. But they've come to trust you. Yeah, they've come to trust us. That's a good way. Yeah. We feed them. We hand feed them. Yep. You know, and uh, and they trust. They, they, they know trust you're us. not going to hurt them, so they're not skittish around you. Right. Exactly. And we we've set up little feed dishes for them. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we, we've got like, uh, we, we feed them sunflower seeds and they, they get almonds for treats. Okay. Yeah. You said the almonds are like their candy, right? Oh, it's like crack for them. They, they yeah. go nuts over them. Yeah. Look yeah. and see, they get, they go nuts over them. See what I did there? <laughs> so, um, so the, the, the older chip, I, the reason I say older chipmunks is because we found out now that uh, we've got we got chip chip and we got swish okay and those are the two older chipmunks that are up and around and then we've got tank and tank kind of runs around but isn't around on a regular basis i think tank actually goes between our yard and the neighbor's yard and tank's the male right i think tank's a male yes but you also thought swish was a male until i did recently. until recently yeah yeah um so chip chip and swish are females and up until recently like you said I didn't think Swish had had a, a litter of babies, um, but Chip Chip had a litter of babies, and I think three, no, two. No, Chip Chip had three. And then Swish, we found out, no, Ch- uh, Swish had a litter of three. Chip Chip had a litter of two. We found this out just yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm folding towels, and I put them at the top of the stairs to bring downstairs because we have a shower downstairs and we have a bath, two bathrooms upstairs. So um, I'm folding up towels and I'm getting them kind of ready to bring downstairs. <laughs> and I go to grab, we kind of have like a area where we stack, uh, you know, you know, everybody kind of has an area in our area is a closet near the, near the foyer yeah. where we stack, you know, like sodas and, and excess paper towels. and It's like a miscellaneous yeah. corner. Yeah, yeah like yeah. a miscellaneous corner. So we've got this corner where we stack stuff, you know, in, in this closet. So I go in the, I go in the, in the corner. Or I'm about to go in the corner. I'm stacking towels. I'm about to go in the corner. And in that corner is where all the, the feed is for the chipmunks. Uh, I'm about to go in that corner and I was going to grab something to drink. I think it was a Gatorade or something. I was about to go grab a Gatorade. And all of a sudden, I hear a chipmunk start chattering at me, like right <laughs> next to me. like And I in went, the house. In the house. Yeah. Now, the two older chipmunks know not to come in the house. Yeah. So I'm startled. I'm like, what the? And I look, and all I just see is this brown fur running back and forth in front of me. And then zooms past me and runs into the kitchen underneath a cart. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> and in turn, Yoko looks at me and goes, what's the problem? And I said, we have a chipmunk in the house. <laughs> she goes, we have a chipmunk in the house. I go, yeah. She goes, where? I said, under the cart right there in the kitchen. And she goes, oh. And she goes, oh, that's not Chipper Swish. That's one of the babies. Yep. And I went, oh my God, it's one of the babies. Because they don't know. They don't know. No, they don't. Not they don't. Yeah. yeah. And she said the other day that she thought that that she she heard as clear as day one of the babies down in the work area. 
Yeah. But she thought it was because they made their home in the overhang um, down on the ground outside and that she yeah, just so heard them through the brick. She thought it was just that, but really... He was in the house. He was inside in the house. He's been in the, the house. calls for... coming from inside the house. Exactly. <laughs> so this clever little shit's been in the house for a couple days. <laughs> so um, he just came upstairs because he was looking for food. Yeah. Well, he found the food, but he also found me. So he got to eat say, it. And he found a little extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he ran back to the cart. We're trying to corner him. And intern Yoko's got this big, big jar, like big olive jar, trying to, <laughs> trying to corner him and get him it, into the jar. So in my head, outside. I picture both of you dressed in full, like, goalie hockey gear. Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, no. Like, no. with brooms and, and nets. And, and, like, as you were telling me the story the other day, I'm just like, <laughs> That's a funny image. Are you well, just like I just full decked out in like Minnesota wild like <laughs> hockey gear? <laughs> it wasn't. It was. It, it happened way too quick to do that. But keep in mind, I'm, I've also got like a double contact cast on too on my right, yeah, my, yeah. my right foot. Um, but I had a broom in my hand. The only reason I had a broom in my hand was just to kind of steer him. I wasn't going to take a hockey shot at it, but um, I just had it just to kind of steer him one way or another. But I also can't with this double contact cast on. I can't. I can't bend over to get the chipmunk. Right. And that's why you have intern Yoko. Right. So. So. So she goes to the left side to try and get. And I said, "Don't go to the left side and try to drive him. He's going to run a, along the wall because most rodents run a, along a wall. Mm -hmm. And for most people who know about pest control at all." Rodents run along walls. That's what they do. Yeah. So I said, don't, don't do that. They're, he's going to run along the wall. I said, go along the right side and force him out to the left side, and I'll get him from the left side. And so she went to the left side, and he ran along the wall and went into the living room and then went behind <laughs> a chair, right? A, a, a big like recliner-like chair. This is like the scene from Christmas Vacation with the squirrel. That's exactly what it was. So it, it was this. It was this. It was the squirrel scene from Christmas Vacation. But in this instance, it's a chipmunk. Yes, but it's a chipmunk. So the little baby runs behind the chair, and we're trying to get him out from behind the chair. Well, he bolts. We, I go to the right. She goes to the left. He bolts out. When I try to go for him, bolts out to the left, runs out to the left, and then I forgot that the pest guy that from our pest company because everybody out here has a pest pest control we, we live across from an area that has a lot of mice and everybody yeah. in our neighborhood has a, a pest control company because of yeah. the mice now the nice thing about chipmunks is if you have chipmunks they keep the majority of the mice away but we have an area in our foundation that has a crack and the mice get in through there no oh. yeah so we have to have we have to have a, a pest control guy but he left a glue trap upstairs. Oh no! Yeah, and the little chipper got into the into the glue trap. Oh! And I've been meaning to get that glue trap out of there and set a regular trap. Well, now you now you got it. Well, you know, thank God it wasn't a regular trap though. Yeah, otherwise he would have, you know. Yeah. And then broke his neck. Yeah, this way you're at least. I mean, I'm not going to ruin the story, but this was the better of the two options. Yes. Oh, so he runs into the glue, glue trap and we both freak out. So we grab him, we carry him outside. And I'll tell you this much. I told you this the other day. Um, Martha Stewart just isn't for really good food and, and quality sheets anymore. Um, so I quickly Google uh, how to get an animal out of a glue trap. And it's possible. You can do it. Uh -huh. um, and so a Martha Stewart website came up. And it came up and it, it said um, uh, basically to use vegetable oil to get the, the, the animal off the glue and then to use a combination of Dawn dishwashing liquid or any dishwashing liquid for that matter. But yeah. we use Dawn and, and water and to get the, the glue off the animal. So that's what we did. And he's just fine. 
so he he he's just fine and we took it he was in shock of course well yeah that's um, a traumatic thing for the little guy yeah so we got him off the uh we got him off the 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 glue trap we fr- we cut the trap open first so he could breathe and see that he was okay and then i kind of talked to him i talked him down way intern yoko got the dishwashing liquid together and the and we used olive oil so you know he he didn't he didn't get he got all natural ingredients bruiser <laughs> he, he didn't get that we almost he, got he him he didn't gain weight because he didn't of gain the, weight nope what the bad bad fat yep. or whatever <laughs> he didn't get the bad fats he only got the good fats and we almost gave him a loaf of bread with it so he could dip it in it <laughs> um but then um so then uh so then we we got him out of there, and uh, so he kind of hung out with us. He knew we, he was safe after that. I think it was that and the shock, and then we brought him a little dish of uh, sunflower seeds and uh, almonds, but he didn't want to touch any of it because I think he was still kind of like, okay, yeah. I know you guys are okay, but I'm not Have taking Have you seen him today food. since you've saved him? We, yeah, we saw him. We saw oh, him. cool. Yeah. So in, in he's starting to learn how to eat out of the dishes now. He's no, he knows that the dishes are okay. So, so that experience just helped his bond with you. Yeah. He he realizes, oh, you're not evil giants. Mm-hmm. You're you're friendly. You're yeah. You're 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 of the chipmunk kind. <laughs> yes, you're of the chipmunks. We know you're mm-hmm. you're good. Um. So he yeah, but his it's either his brother or sister. He's still bonded with the brother or sister because there comes a time they're solitary creatures. So when mom kicks them out of the nest, they become solitary. Yeah. And, and, and you said they'll fight each other. They do. They fight each other for food. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and they'll fight their own mom because when right. mom kicks them out and she kicks them out and they're, they're out, they're out, out and yeah. they, they're not bad. They, they can never come back in. Right. So like Swish and, and Chip Chip are, Chip Chip mm-hmm. is, is Swish's mom. So. But they don't get along. No, they don't. No, they'll right. fight each other for food. Yeah. Uh, because once she got rid of them, she got rid of them. They don't recognize each other as mother and son. Right. Um, so the the two kids are now out. They're out of the nest. And they're technically adults now, I guess. After six weeks, they're adults. <laughs> <laughs> so they're they're on their own and they're they're out looking for food. And so, you know, they've got the communal dishes there of sunflower seeds. Yeah. And if they so wish we, they, they can, you know, we can start to, once they're comfortable and approaching us, we can, we can hand feed them or start yeah. to hand train them. Uh, if they want to approach us, they kind of look at us now, like, like we kind of know who you are, but we're not quite comfortable yet yeah. approaching you, but. Well, you're, you started in the right direction. I mean, saving yeah. them from the glue trap, <laughs> yeah. that would earn trust right away. You would think, but they, you know, they're wild animals. They're wild animals. Right, exactly. So, that. That's what people yeah. out there got to remember is these are wild animals. You're not yeah. You're not raising chipmunks. <laughs> no, we have we've done nothing to raise them at all. Right, right. But you 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 gain their trust and and they're very skittish animals too. So you have to Yeah. You just have to be very patient, very kind. You use slow movements and and you just talk to them with a, with a calm Christmas tone. Christmas music and hula hoops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting interesting weekend. You're gonna have to bring that up with her tomorrow. Yeah. So I I do want to ask her if uh, if she can tell what kind of I have an unconventional pet. That's the way I'm gonna put it to her and see if she knows what it is and what they think of us. There you go. Because I I don't I mean I because put it this way swish. Swish will come and either tell myself or intern Yoko that the dishes are empty. <laughs> and he does. He's got you guys, or she's got you guys trained. Yes. But, but yeah. now see, I look at it logically. Mm-hmm. We're Swish's food source. Right. So if the dishes are empty, of course, Swish is going to come up and look at us funny and say, hey, stupid, the dishes are empty. Yeah. I'm yeah. here for food. Yeah. You're, you don't have the food out. I need it. Right. Yep. Just like... Just like your cat tells you when the food dish is empty, just like your dog will tell you when the food dish is empty. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the animal loving you. No. It's, it's just the food dishes are empty. Go fill the two, dishes. Your, your two-year-old child will do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It has nothing to do with love whatsoever. It's just, no. you know. So, yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. The dishes are empty. So, um, yep. that, and that's, you know, I, I've, I've 
I've, I've told people that before on the show and they're, oh, that's so harsh. Why would you say that? Of course my cat or dog loves me. No. Not necessarily. And no, I, I've always, I always tell my wife, like, you know, if you die, he's going to eventually eat you. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's what it is. Like they're, they're food, you know, it's yeah. survival yeah. for them. And I, I don't, I don't think, and, and although the, the, chipmunks remember us from season to season i don't cast any aspersions i don't think that these animals love me right i just think that they know that we're a food source and you're just happy to have the companionship yeah yeah i just think it's really cool that these yeah that these chipmunks you know they they look forward to seeing us because they accept you yeah they accept us Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah yeah so that's it. And that's that. It's just kind of a, it's not a paranormal story by any means, but it was <laughs> kind of a funny story that uh, one of the babies got in the house. Yeah. So, and it uh, goes right along the line of what's happening tomorrow. So exactly. And it happens to, uh, it happens to tie into what's going on with Karen Anderson. Now, unfortunately, Karen is not taking uh, any readings here on air with us. Um, but um and that's that because Bruiser brought that up with uh, the cat and whatnot. And I, I, Karen came highly recommended by a couple of different friends um, that wanted to hear her here on the show. And so, um, unfortunately, we're not able to uh, to do anything where we can set up readings ahead of time uh, with Karen. But um, I'm sure she's probably going to have her website or how to get in yes. contact to set up yeah. an appointment with her. Yeah, yeah. She's she's got uh, she'll have information on how to get an appointment set up with her. Um, I hear she's very good. She's very very good. Um, so we'll talk to her a little bit about her story tomorrow on the show, and uh, we'll talk to her about communicating with animals and how you can actually communicate with your animals. Nice. How how you can get little hints and signs that your, your animals trying to communicate with you, how they're trying to tell you different things, uh, things like that. So that's coming up on tomorrow's show. Um, I'm looking forward to it because, okay. um, because, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, animals have different ways of communicating with us. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well tomorrow. Um, so that's, what's going on for this week. And again, uh, folks, if you were a, a Stitcher listener and you were trying to listen to us through Stitcher this week and found out you couldn't, uh, well, we're on Audio Boom now. So uh, you can listen to us any other way. You can listen to us through the Darkness Radio app. You can listen to us uh, on Spotify. You can listen to us on the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to us on any any way that you listen. Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Uh, We're available on all different formats that you can listen to out there. So uh, if you followed us over seamlessly, thank you very much for listening. We appreciate it. And uh, we've got some things in the works. We've got some appreciation things in the works that we're going to uh, be doing very shortly here. Uh, We like to call it one of a a kind physical NFTs. Uh, (laughs) Things that you don't necessarily, uh, you don't have to... um, you don't have to buy uh, digitally and say that you own. In other words, uh, we're just going to do giveaways. Um, so, but it's a one of a kind thing. Like literally, you own it, and that's it. Yes. Um, so we'll just call it a physical NFT. Um, so we'll we'll do something like that here, uh, coming down the line here in, in a few weeks, um, as a way of just saying that we appreciate you guys uh, uh, and that we appreciate you for. Uh, hanging in there again uh, some small changes we we said yesterday and we'll say it again today uh, true crime tuesday now yep. has dumb crime stupid criminals baked back into it you don't have to uh, pay five dollars a month for that it's now free it's an inflation buster can't beat free that's all right so you now have <laughs> dumb crime stupid criminals for free and it's uh, in the darkness radio um, thread or the darkness radio feed so you don't know you no longer have to look for that uh, and be a, a, a premium subscriber anywhere it's free so you now have that every Tuesday for free um, so just little changes here and there that, that are all benefiting you because yep. we want to show you how much we appreciate you we know times are tough the only thing you have to do is listen to an ad that's it simple 30 simple, seconds simple stuff simple stuff So we're going to let you go for today. Thank you so much for listening to Supernatural News. 
And uh, we'll catch you tomorrow on the flip side with Karen Anderson for Beer City Bruiser. I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for listening to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Dark Mystery.